Your Royal Highness, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us here today for World Horse Welfare's annual conference, which poses the key question, who is responsible? On a personal note, can I say what a great pleasure it is to be off the campaign trail? There are only so many babies to be kissed. But also, on a personal note, Your Royal Highness, to thank you for coming today and for all that you've done for this industry. As many some here will know, my father rode many of your grandmothers great jump horses for Peter Kasler when he was training and when he needed the help of the Interjockeys Fund. You've been an amazing supporter. Thank you. But also as a Member of Parliament for Mid-Norfolk, I see firsthand the extraordinary professionalism of the organisation that Rowley and the team um, run and the incredible impact it has across the country. But also I think at this time, as the country chooses uh, who is going to take responsibility, this theme of who really is responsible for an issue that goes to the heart of everybody in this country, the welfare of animals who depend on us, could not be more timely. It's also a great pleasure to have a chance to thank the Sir Peter O'Sullivan Trust, who've been huge supporters of most of the best projects in racing and for sponsoring today's event. Thank you. I'm hugely pleased to welcome you all here. There are some health and safety announcements, but also some quite fun practical things. This event is digitally being streamed across the country, so please take out your phones, make sure they're turned off, but look at the hashtag on Twitter, hashtag responsible for horses. And those of you who know how to tweet, please tweet away and let's see if we can get this trending above the general election. <laughs> please do all join in the conversation. That is part of, an important part of the outreach of uh, World Horse Welfare. Before we begin the programme, uh, an incredible range of presentations today. I just want to draw your attention to a few points for your security and health and safety. The current terror level threat in this part of London is substantial, which is two levels down from the most serious, but it's still significant. So we do have security precautions in place to ensure we keep everyone safe. Please do make sure you wear, you wear your name badge and that it's visible at all times. I think, Your Royal Highness, you're probably all right without the name badge. In case of fire, the alarm will sound and you should leave the building. There are entrances clearly marked. Outside the building, make your way to the nearest exit on the street level, and then we gather, appropriately enough, outside the Royal Albert Hall. First aid, there are several members of staff here who are fully trained, and if you have a problem, please go to reception immediately, and there's a first aid room. And photographs, during the course of the event, there will be photographers. If you'd rather not have uh, your face photographed for any reason, please have a word with them afterwards and just make sure they're aware. I wanted to highlight a really important part of today, the uh, charity in action. After the presentations this morning in the main theatre, please do join us during lunch, and in the education centre from 1.55, there'll be a series of charity in action presentations, three brief five-minute talks about some of the charity's inspiring work with others uh, to foster even more responsible behaviours in the horse world. And I, I'd highly recommend, I've had a preview, that you go and have a look. Uh, and you'll hear from the front line through World Horse Welfare's field officer, Penny Baker, who is literally on the front line, the many layers of responsibility for equine welfare in the UK and how they do and should interlink. You'll also be able to hear some quite alarming results on biosecurity conducted by the Equine Disease Coalition and how they're seeking ways to change behaviour to better protect UK horses from disease. And given that behaviour change is so vital to this whole topic, we're going to be having a wonderful talk from Katie Lightfoot from the University of Notting Nottingham exploring how behavioural science can be used to improve the horse-human partnership. All these presentations are seriously high quality. Finally, I just want to reiterate our thanks to this conference's sponsor, the Sir Peter O'Sullivan Charitable Trust, for helping make the whole event possible, as well as to the Horse Race Betting Levy Board and keeping Britain's horses healthy for all of your support. We're also grateful, literally, for your support, and you will notice that in your pack there is an envelope. This is not for Christmas cards. This is for you to make a small donation to support the work of the charity. Please do, or even a large donation. Now, to get the show underway, I'm delighted to introduce World Horse Welfare's Chairman, Mr. Michael Baines. Thank you, George. Um, Your Royal Highness, Your Excellencies, Lords, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our conference. And what a turnout. I and mean, you're right up in the second row. Stalls, it's fantastic. Um, so, uh, 
I must echo George's uh, thanks to, to Geoffrey Hughes and the trustees of the Peter O'Sullivan Trust for their ongoing support. Um, and how nice that there's a picture of, the, of Peter O'Sullivan on the front, because the help that uh, that organisation that you give to not just us that's supporting here, but also to equine welfare in general is, is, is fantastic, and thank you. And then I must also please, if I may, echo the, the, the thanks to the Horse Race Levy Board and to M M MDS Animal Health for their support for us today. Um, now, in my role as chairman, I've had the privilege of visiting some of our operations both in Southern Africa and in Central America and seeing so how the charity works in support of local communities uh, to improve the lives of working equids. And these are equids that are very, very rarely used for leisure, but are working animals and absolutely vital uh, to the families who rely on them. Uh, and it never ceases to amaze me when you, actually there are well over 100 million around the world. So if you want thinks about it, they're probably supporting 800 million of the very poorest people. Um, and the point of this is to say how proud it makes me that World Horse Welfare has become the very first equine charity to receive UK aid to match funding from the government in support of a, a project that we're doing in, in Haiti, um, which is absolutely typical of the work that we and other charities who are under the ICWI umbrella um, do to support the independence of those people uh, and, and the work and helping them. And <clears throat> for reasons that are quite beyond my understanding. I'm not actually allowed to announce how much we've raised. It's, it's something to do with the election going on and civil service being impaired, but why that's relevant, I don't understand. Anyway, it's well in excess of the target we th first thought of, and um, I wanted to congratulate and slightly blow World Horse Welfare's trumpet, because I think you've done a fantastic job. And, uh, and, and perhaps even more importantly, I think the recognition of government, and perhaps hopefully supranational governments, so as the EU, the UN, um, that actually by supporting this very special sector, the UK international equine welfare sector, uh, they can effectively channel aid to the very poorest members of society right across the globe. And that's an enormous step forward. And I hope this is the first uh, of a stream of these in the future. Um, they're very hard work, but they are rewarding, and it's tremendous to see that this one is, is that we've successfully completed them. Now, to the subject in hand today. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only one who thinks that in a world where every activist is talking about rights, whether human or animal, we're actually talking about responsibilities. And I can't help thinking that actually if we all thought about responsibilities and duties, rather than rights, we, the world would be a much better place, but that's a bit of a personal view. Um, so the subject is, who is responsible? Uh, and I think, look, looking at the agenda, we, we've got a fantastic team of speakers, so thank you all for being here. Um, and we're going to start with a film, which is, I think, very powerful, and after that I shall hand over to Rowley. Thank you. The horse. The horse has long been our companion, our confidant, our passion, our partner, and our escape. Beauty, grace, power. But it has long been said, where there is great power, there is great responsibility. Over the past few years, we've spoken about a rising trend in welfare concerns involving large groups of horses, often along with other animals. Equine welfare charities, alongside other agencies, are striving to work more effectively at working together to tackle these concerns and the root causes that lead to them. For the very worst cases, we need to work with Parliament to ensure an increase in sentences for the worst animal cruelty offences from six months to
to five years. This is just one way that we can create a proper deterrent to those who willingly abuse horses. Collaboration with other NGOs and institutions has never been more important to help horses. With organizations like the OIE, UN and FAO, all now have working animals on the agenda. Development Aid also has a role to play in supporting working animals around the world. World Horse Welfare is proud to have been the first equine charity to receive UK aid match funding from the UK government for our project helping equid-owning communities in Haiti. Working horses were a feature of the World Horse Trail, which launched in Windsor back in the spring. The muse for the trail was a rehomed horse called Lucas, whose story of being found as an abandoned, frozen foal captivated audiences. Cases like Lucas's highlight how responsible members of the public are the eyes and ears of the equine charity world. Their reporting of concerns is critical to the rescue of neglected horses. Developing a new generation of responsible horse owners is vital. We must look to social media influencers and celebrities, using their reach and authority to educate and gather support for promoting the right way to treat horses. Communication is a key step in ensuring responsibility. Which is why World Horse Welfare has been looking at ways of engaging hard-to-reach communities and gaining understanding of the mental health issues around animal hoarding. The wider horse-owning community have a responsibility for ensuring good welfare too. With the outbreaks of equine influenza, Responsible shows and sporting events rightfully put a blanket ban on horses that have not been properly vaccinated. And sport has a significant responsibility, not only in protecting welfare during the competition, but for the whole of the horse's life. They also need to provide an accurate, evidence-based approach to their rules and regulations. This year, we will explore who is responsible, gaining an understanding in what it means for horses and ourselves. Your Royal Highness, my Lords, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the World Horse Welfare Conference 2019. Your Royal Highness, Your Excellency, my Lords, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to this year's conference. And I'd just like to extend a special thank you, George, for joining us today as parliamentary candidate for Mid-Norfolk. I appreciate you've got one or two things on at the moment. But I'm delighted that as Minister of Transport, at least I knew you'd get here on time. <laughs> but responsibility is clearly a burning topic in today's society, and so it should be. It's a simple word with complex implications for our planet, our communities, our sector, and our own lives. As Abraham Lincoln said, you cannot escape the responsibility for tomorrow by evading it today. There is no doubt that society across the world is changing. We are witnessing a significant shift in morals and values, and so much that was once considered acceptable is no longer, and vice versa. This trend will only continue as society challenges existing assumptions about inequality, human rights, animal rights, and the environment. So what do we mean by responsibility? It is a combination of both a personal and collective duty, and it's most certainly not always just someone else's responsibility. We all have roles to play in this fragile web of the equine world and beyond. Collectively and personally, we are responsible for what we do do and what we don't do. 
A simple example of collective responsibility is the growing recognition by organizations that to achieve greatest impact, we need to work in partnership with others. Sometimes this is easy, sometimes it's hard, but we do it because it's the right thing to do and it works. But what happens when some of the weaker links in this fragile web break down? Since 2011, equine welfare charities have been highlighting the ongoing crisis in England and Wales, with nearly 7,000 horses still at risk of needing immediate rescue. That's nearly a decade. If it's lasted that long, can we really call it a crisis? No, because we have to admit that what we are experiencing here is systemic failure. Enforcement of the Animal Welfare Act largely isn't working because responsibility has effectively been devolved to charities funded by the public who have constrained resources and no powers. It is the local authorities and the police who have powers under the Act, but all too often do not have the resources to meet their responsibilities. And we will hear from Inspector Dave Smith after coffee on current, pro uh, current approaches that are making a difference. One significant barrier to resolving equine welfare cases on this scale is capacity. Who has the resources, space and capability to take in and care for 7,000 horses? Is it the responsibility of the authorities, so the taxpayer, and charities, so their donors? Or as a nation, do we need to accept that too many horses have been bred and that euthanasia can and should be a welfare option when there is nowhere that can take them? This can be a more humane, albeit always difficult decision, than subjecting them to a low level of care or worse still, complete neg neglect. So what is driving the problem? We have certainly seen a rise in animal hoarding. And just before coffee, Bronwyn Williams will speak about the challenges of this mental disorder. So often behind an equine welfare case lies a human welfare case. In these situations, sometimes the abusers are more victims than villain. A more powerful driver is that breeders and dealers can overbreed and indiscriminately breed, often for commercial purposes, and then fly graze, neglect or dump the animals they no longer want with no consequences. We must find a way of regulating dealers, and arguably breeders too, if this can ever be enforced. And we entreat others to work with us to develop, to develop a workable scheme here. Then there is lack of accountability of the dealers, the owners, the authorities, and others who do not accept that they are failing to live up to their responsibilities. But why is there so often no accountability who, for those who abuse horses? The new equine identification regulations, and most crucially, the central equine database, has the potential to link every horse to an owner, to make them accountable. But right now, the prospect of this brighter vision looks fairly bleak. The system still isn't working. And we have a collective responsibility to change this, starting with creating a way for owners to easily update their information on the central equine database and ensuring that all horses, donkeys and mules, are microchipped by the various deadlines across our four nations. As a charity, Welt Horse Welfare strives to recognise the ever-changing nature of our responsibilities and to those around us. Sometimes being responsible is actually about trusting and supporting others to take on responsibility. In the UK, we are working to rehome more horses by moving more responsibility to our rehomers. For example, through the introduction of a project horse, project horse category where rehomers with the right experience can take on more of the rehabilitation and retraining of a horse. And more broadly, we have shifted the emphasis to asking why we shouldn't rehome an animal to someone rather than why we should. Horse sport is certainly very much in the spotlight when it comes to responsibility, something that I know that this afternoon's discussion panel will consider. There's a growing acceptance that this responsibility is for the lifetime of the horse. 
which is an integral element of the horse sport earning its social licence to operate, as is recognising the growing public interest in the ethics of horse sport and horse racing. And it will be good to hear Anna Marie shortly talking about BHA's approach to these issues um, in a few minutes. We have discussed many times before that meeting our responsibilities to the horse is also about challenging the status quo. And we are increasingly recognising the importance of creating behavioural change to do just this. Behaviour change is as relevant to policymakers as it is to individuals. Government has used behavioural change science for everything, from encouraging people to stop smoking to paying their taxes on time. We are currently seeing policy changes around junk food and sugar intake to co combat rising rates of human obesity. And some companies are acting too. I wonder, given the epidemic levels of equine obesity in the UK, whether we in the equine sector could learn some lessons here too. But one way to motivate change is by challenging ourselves with the evidence, rather than relying on our own opinions. Of course, facts alone do not change behaviour, but they can objectively reveal a reality we do not see. This is so imp important when considering an issue like bridal fit, a topic that is rightly now getting greater attention. And Rachel Murray will shortly speak on some of her latest work in this area. However, we must remember that all evidence was not created equally. Responsible scientists will undertake painstaking studies using robust methodology, and yet will still caveat their, their results are a tool to inform decisions and not a holy grail of a solution in itself. Research that is not rigorously stress-tested risks being just fake news, or worse still, drawing the wrong conclusions. For World Horse Welfare, our new strategy recognises that being responsible includes being as evidence-based as possible. Investing in more research is vital, and hence we are delighted to have taken on advancing equine scientific excellence from the BEF earlier this year, a collaboration to help harness the considerable research potential in equine colleges across the country. But of course, we must never forget our experience and common sense. The principles can be quite simple. If it looks wrong or it feels wrong, then it probably is wrong. And just because there is not widely published evidence of the importance of working equids to the livelihoods of nearly 800 million people in low- and middle-income countries around the world does not mean it is not fact. Collectively, we are investing more research here. But given, even given the success of our UK Aid Match project, more governments, development agencies and other institutions need to use their common sense and experience in the field to recognise that these working animals make all the difference between life and death for these communities and their livestock. We all know that a little bit of knowledge can be a dangerous thing. The speed and ease of communication, especially on social media, can be a great force for good if used responsibly. It can bring people together, help share experiences and information, and encourage people to act responsibly. Esme Higgs, the, the popular equestrian YouTube star, will highlight the good social media can do after our coffee break. However, it is also true that it can be hugely disruptive if used irresponsibly. For example, members of the public calling our welfare line with first-hand information of a welfare case play an, such an important role. But others will share photos far and wide about welfare cases and urge action by charities, sometimes even asking people to flood their welfare lines with calls. The consequences are predictable. The welfare lines are blocked with callers who have no real or new information to help resolve the case, and the owner of the welfare case is alerted and can spirit the horse to an unknown location to avoid scrutiny. 
We recognise that this can be hugely frustrating, that people find it so difficult to see horses being kept in far from ideal conditions. We do too. But whilst the answer might look simple, it rarely is. Resolving these cases usually takes time, and we must act within the law. Charities cannot, by law, update the public on detailed or progress with investigations tied to individuals. But this does not mean we are not working hard to fulfil our responsibilities. So I implore you, before you post about a case, please ask yourself how sharing over social networks will actually help the welfare of the horses concerned. So, we are all part of a fragile interweave web of connection and responsibility, relying on each other to meet our responsibilities to make our precious equine sector work. We can pay lip service to this, or we can act. We can look at our part in the world and accept it, or we can bury our heads in the sand of blame and pass the buck. But if we want to keep pace with our changing society and to address today's systemic welfare challenges across the globe, something has got to change, and part of that something is us. This does not always need to be gold standard. Small steps and partnerships converging around shared goals and aspirations can make a world of difference, both in the short and the long term. The future is in our hands. The question is, can we meet President Lincoln's challenge and fulfil our responsibilities today for the betterment of tomorrow? I really hope so, because society, and especially the next generation, will not forgive us if we do not act now. Thank you so much. Really, thank you. I think the strength of that applause shows what respect you and your team are rightly held in. It's an incredible professional world-class operation that you're building. And as Michael said, the award of that international recognition is a sign that this charity is leading the world in this space. And we need to sing that out. Now, we're not trending yet on social media, folks. So if you haven't got your phone out, please get it out, put it on silent, and follow the hashtag. Really talked about responsibility. It's an easy word to use and quite a difficult thing sometimes to take. We experienced that as a family recently when I took my young godchildren, uh, all under 10, on a pony trek riding holiday in Wales. It was wonderful. We all arrived at the farm, struggling like many farms are, uh, uh, to, to make a living. A lot of ponies, a lot of happy children. I'm not an expert, but I could tell that these horses had sores. Many of them weren't properly shooed. They, had, they weren't in good order. What do you do? Who do you ring? I mean, who's responsible? Clearly the people who own the, own the horses, but we're all responsible, that's the question Rowley's asking. And who do you ring? And in the racing industry that many of us love, who's responsible for the horses that it kicks out? Where do they go? And in Norfolk, who's responsible? Big questions. There's no one better to tackle them than our next guest, Amory Phelps. Uh, 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 Somebody who's shown real leadership in sport across the board, comes from a very distinguished rowing family and background, uh, was heavily involved in the success of the Olympics, and now leads the British uh, Horse Racing Association, and is doing great work with the team to lead responsibility there. Amory, welcome. Your Royal Highness, Your Excellency, Lords, Ladies and Gentlemen, I am truly honoured to speak to you here today. Your history as a charity working to improve the lives of horses across the globe for more than 90 years leaves me humbled. And it's even more special, actually, to be invited to speak at the Royal Geographical Society. Uh, so it was a legacy of, of pioneers such as Darwin, Livingston, Sir Robert Scott, Mallory, and Irvin, himself a rower, um, that inspired me to study geography at university. So if I have the odd goosebump standing here, please forgive me. Um, I've only been working in horse racing since June, um, after many years of working across a number of sports. But much has changed since I rode in the women's eight at the Atlanta Olympics in 96. During my, during my time as chair of British Rowing, vice chair of the British Paralympic Association, and in my current role as vice chair of the British Olympic Association, I have seen a rapid pace of change in the way that people watch and participate in sport. 
Its broadening appeal has extended the media and others' scrutiny of the politics and governance of sport. Social attitudes are changing just as quickly. The duty of care of sports bodies towards participants is increasingly codified. Good mental health, keeping vulnerable youngsters and participants safe, these are just as important as winning medals. Any institution that doesn't get these things right is vulnerable. Like many sports and across society, we have to be mindful of our duty of care to participants in racing. But we, like all equestrian sports, have animals to consider too. In racing, we make champions of horses. We celebrate them as competitors and as companions, and we want them to enjoy a life worth living. We do what's right for them, enriching their lives through sport, whilst they set our hearts racing. The theme you've chosen for today is very much on our minds at present. The BHA, racing's governing body, is proud of its values of integrity and accountability. Nothing is more important than the responsibility that we share with all in racing to look after our people and our horses. So today, if you'll allow me, I want to touch on four areas. I want to share with you how racing fulfills that responsibility to our horses. I'll talk about how we meet the ethical challenge in using horses in sport and leisure. I want to share with you our thinking about how we communicate the responsibility we take. And I want to suggest how we, horse lovers all, might collectively meet this challenge together. I've been really privileged as the new BHA chair to see behind the scenes in racing with some of our finest trainers, breeders, and dedicated staff. I have seen many sports the world over and looked under the bonnet of a few as well. And I know that when I see passion, pride, and a deep sense of care and responsibility, and racing has these for both its equine and its human athletes. Horse welfare, as we've seen, is an emotive issue. And those who work with racehorses do so around the clock. They know that fit, happy, healthy horses will give their best on the race course. <coughs> it's clear, talking to our trainers and jockeys, our owners, race course and stable staff, that this relationship requires trust between horses and the exceptional humans who train, ride, and care for them. There's a very special bond between the horse and the human. Nobody talks about this better than Bryony Frost, one of our leading jump jockeys. And this is what she said of her ride on Frodon at the Cheltenham Festival when she became the first female rider to win a grade one race there. And I can't do um, Bryony's accent at all, I'm afraid. But, but she said, he grabbed a hold of me and he said, don't you dare give up. We've got one more fence. We've got the whole hill to go. He was incredible when I really needed him. And I needed him most at the last. And when the stride is there and when you can see it and he gives it to you, he wants more. The determination is underneath you. Every day, in every racing yard and livery stables, you will find bonds like this between people and horses. You find passion, eloquence, and an extraordinary work ethic. For many, this isn't a job. It isn't even about taking responsibility. It's a way of life. It's a vocation. As a sports regulator, the BHA stands alongside our racing colleagues as we fulfill our shared but distinct responsibilities. Theirs to provide that care and welfare, and ours to assure the public that they have the confidence that as a sport we are doing so by, main by maintaining the highest standards. We need to talk much more about the good practice that we promote and that we see happening, and not just the safety net that we we that we provide for rare exceptions. We need to talk about the £32 million of levy money that has been spent on veterinary research in recent years, which has helped, for example, fund the Animal Health Trust's work on equine flu and others. We've put in place an industry-wide 
Horse Welfare Board in racing, where the BHA, as the regulator of equine welfare, sits alongside representatives from across our sport and the industry that supports it. It's independently chaired by your former chair, Barry Johnson, and we have political input from the former sports minister, Tracy Crouch. The Horse Welfare Board is currently developing a programme of activity to cover the whole industry, and not just the regulated areas that we directly cover, and which will be published in the new year. And I'm immensely grateful to them and look forward to the strategy, which will also consider, for example, how we use the whip and the issues that that presents to us. The BHA has been criticised by some in our sport for having a defensive and perhaps reactionary mindset. It's clear that we have, as a sport, been on the back foot and under pressure to justify what we do, sometimes lacking confidence to tell our great story. Racing's the story. And I can promise you that no one is as frustrated as my new colleagues at the BHA, and no one is keener for us to break out of this defensive pattern. So, how might we meet the moral challenge presented by our critics in a positive and proactive way? Public trust is in short supply for all institutions, and so racing must be open, inclusive, and honest about the reality of the lives of working animals. I believe that we must acknowledge that there is an ethical debate and start with a clear affirmation of the morality of using horses in sport and leisure. Dr. Madeleine Campbell from the Royal Veterinary College, who's here today, has set this out so clearly in the work that she's done, and we are indebted to her for her work in this emotive area. Madeleine has articulated what those of you who work with horses instinctively believe, that the benefits to horses and society from taking part in sport outweighs the risks. We have to recognize that we have an obligation to minimize avoidable risk, of course, as in all sports, both human and equine, but we cannot remove all risk. Madeline has rightly challenged racing to demonstrate that we're acting to ensure the well-being of our equine athletes, not just in our vis visible arenas, but also away from the track, before and after a horse's racing career. You will undoubtedly see that spelt out in our welfare strategy, but I can reassure you that it is already embedded in the thinking of those at the BHA and across our industry. For example, we're already working to ensure the traceability of racehorses throughout their lifetime to secure the best welfare outcomes possible starting with the requirement to notify us 30 days after a foal is born. And we also work closely with organisations that provide care for racehorses after their racing career. Our charity, Retraining of Racehorses, helps horses along this journey, often to a place in many of your sports represented in this room. And I'd like to thank you all very much for working with us in this area. But what more can we do? I'd suggest that we must focus on demonstrating what we do to maximize the benefits to horses and what we do to minimize the risks. So let's consider the benefits. Some of these are easy to see, the physical environment, the dietary provisions, the veterinary care. Our trainers and breeders, in fact, often go well beyond industry standards to bring out the best in their horses. Investing in regular scans and the best possible training surfaces but the well-being that horses experience is harder to capture. How can we measure the benefits to Frodon of that very special relationship with Bryony Frost? Or the joie de vivre shown by the wonderfully eloquent, by the joie de vivre shown by the wonderful Enable, um, the horse of the year at the Cartier Awards yesterday, a true champion filly that was so eloquently described by our leading flat trainer, John Gosden. John says, when she was younger, she would run with unhindered exuberance and was often winning her race as well. Now she's got a little older and wiser. She's rather like a boxer who knows how to win on points rather than going straight in for the immediate knockout. And I think that's maturity. 
Well, if we let ourselves off the bridle a bit more and talk about our horses with the same exuberance as a young enable, that would be a good start. But we want to go further. We want to try and quantify the benefits to a horse's well-being. So we've commissioned a project with Bristol University to develop a well-being and welfare assessment. And the aim is to see if we can identify factors that contribute most to the quality of life to a horse's well-being. If we can, it should be possible to do the same for horses in other sports and leisure too. So then if I turn to how we approach minimising the risks, we've already seen uh, race course fatalities fall by over a third in the last 20 years. And we'll continually review this to see if there are opportunities to further reduce that. But always tempered by the knowledge that all of us share that we can never eliminate all the risks from physical activity. Our approach is to gather and to use data as medical researchers have done in human health and better understand injury prevention and safer racing. Some yards or trainers have lower injury rates than others and race courses differ too. But to understand why, we really need to see what robust analysis of data can add to the intuitive horse sense developed over many years by our participants. So we're going to take this data um, and use it to build a model that helps us to identify risks and reduce them where possible. This predictive model, as we're calling it, will work in a very similar fashion to the way that the insurance uh, industry, for example, looks at a huge range of driving factors to understand the risk of motoring. And when coupled with the expertise of trainers, of our clerks of the course, our skillful riders and our vets, this will help us to better identify risks that can be reasonably avoided. Our ambition is to see just what is achievable. And I think it's really exciting and groundbreaking in a global sport such as ours. Talking about horse welfare um, isn't easy. If I'm honest, I would acknowledge that we're probably not connecting with people in the way that we would like to at present, whether this is inside or outside of our sport. And it's a global problem for racing, particularly at this time, and you'll have seen from Rowley's slides earlier on some of the, the things that are going on around the world. But it's also a problem for other equestrian sports, I think. We have been tra tracking public opinion in surveys about the acceptability of using animals in sport. In 2011, the gap between those in favour and those not was 26%. By last year, it was down to 14%. That's a measure of the shift in public attitudes to animals in just seven years. So how should we engage audiences outside racing to achieve our goal of being relevant, understood and accepted in a changing and modern Britain? First, we need to be purposeful. We're clear that our purpose is to make champions of horses and to ensure that every horse bred to race has a great quality of life. But we need to be clear about acting upon that purpose too. Second, we need to be open and transparent, welcoming interest in how we look after the horses and ready to engage with those who question us. Thirdly, we need to familiarise people with horses and animals. We need to give people enough information to address the questions that they have so that they can reach their own conclusion. Next, we need to show empathy with those who have concerns about the effects on horses. They care, and we care. So let's start by acknowledging that, and then engage. And finally, I really believe that we can inspire people with the power of our sport. It is a sport that enriches the lives of horses and humans. And we know that emotions eventually can speak louder than evidence. Of course, none of this is easy. We need to deepen our understanding of the people that we want to reach and to adapt our language and how we tell our story. But I know that we can do this. I'd like to leave you with a final thought and a request. How might we, who live or work with horses, meet this challenge together? Your Royal Highness, I hope you will forgive me for um, going back to your speech here two years ago. But the Princess Royal talked repeatedly in her message very strongly about partnerships and how much further we can go if we go together. 
There is far more that unites us than divides us. We saw this at badminton in May when Yogi Breisner and Mike Etherington-Smith gave a brilliant cross-country course walk to a range of leaders from horse racing and the BHA. Mark Phillips and David O'Connor shared their experience and their vision for eventing. We already see it in the partnerships that we have with others in the equestrian world, with the Pony Club and the Pony Racing Authority, engaging the young with opportunities to develop and test their riding on many of our courses. We see it too in the work we do with the British Horse Society in training or education to provide a pathway for young people into our sport or yours. And we see it year in, year out in the work we do with World Horse Welfare and with the RSPCA, both of whom we truly value as critical friends to racing. We've had some initial conversations in recent months with leaders of other sports and with those who champion equine welfare about extending our collaboration. And I sense a common view is forming that we should work together to promote the place of horses in our national life, to ensure that the moral case for horses in sport and leisure is articulated and properly understood. And I look forward to continuing those conversations and to building an effective partnership. I'm determined to leave my successors a more resilient, robust, and sustainable sport. And I'm sure our future is inextricably linked to yours. I want to thank you all very much for listening to me today, for all of your work in caring for horses, and particularly everyone that's uh, helped produce, put together today, because I'm sure that this is going to be of huge value in this gathering. Thank you all for listening. Amory, thank you very much. I think all of us who take an interest will have noticed the leadership of the British Horse Racing Authority. Um, in particular, the influence on jockeys not overusing the whip. Wasn't it lovely to see Frankie didn't touch Enable with a whip? But also days like the National, all the horses properly looked after and in a very public way so that people can see what we all know, that people who work with horses love them. I think you've touched on something else as well, that horse welfare and human welfare tend to go together, and that the best companies, the best stables, the best organisations, excellence is infectious. John Gosden isn't just a good trainer of horses, he's a good manager of people. If you visit his stable, you'll see today's stable staff get a totally different welfare package, and rightly so, and the BHA is doing brilliant work on all of that. I remember the first job I ever had in a stable, I'd just come down from Cambridge. The groom next to me had just come down from the Hamilton Penitentiary. And to watch the way the horses that he looked after changed his life. I put it to you, I watched somebody discover love for the first time in the way that Bryony touches on there. That connection is so precious. And I think this industry could not just deliver good welfare, but turn that welfare into something therapeutically very powerful for so many broken people. Look, I'd, I'd now like to introduce somebody right on the front line of uh, treating sport horses in a very long and distinguished veterinary career. Dr. Rachel Murray is going to speak to us about the importance of tack, and in particular, the bridle. Rachel, welcome to the stage. Thank you very much. Um, I am talking about the bridle, because we, we, off, we think carefully about our saddles. Saddles are often fitted and measured to our horses. However, bridles are often forgotten. Horses use bridles in many situations. They're routinely, um, they are um, used all across the world. But do we think carefully about how they actually fit to the individual horse? There are many important structures in the head. These include the bones, the wing of the atlas, which protrudes just behind the headpiece, the, um, the uh, tongue and the mouth, the joint of the jaw, the temporomandibular joint, and also the hyoid apparatus, which is the apparatus that they swallow with, attaches to the tongue, and is also attached by muscles to the front leg and also to the, to the chest. We have lots of nerves that come out, under the out of protuberances in the head, which happen to sit just underneath where we routinely keep the bridle. 
there has been a lot of concerns raised on social media and in other places in relation to parts of the bridle, in particular nose bands and bits. Some of this research is well supported. Other parts of the research or the things that are used or put across on social media have less evidence to support these claims. A lot of this focus has been on nose bands and has been on bits. However, there has been little discussion about the rest of the bridle. So what do we know? One of the things that has been supposed to be associated with bridles has been whether we get oral lesions, so damage to the inside of the mouth or inside of the cheeks. And when this has been looked at in various studies of competition horses, it's been seen that this has a fairly high incidence in racehorses, polo ponies, Danish, and in Danish competition horses, which were measured after competition, there were about 9% of these horses had, had oral lesions. This was associated with, um, in a study recently, potentially a noseband tightness, but also associated with not having a noseband in that area at all. So do we know, how much do we know? In Icelandic ponies, 62% of those ponies were ridden in a snaffle who had cheek lesions. Now, there seems to be a slight association with bit type for the type of lesions. However, is this because of the bridle or the noseband, or is this actually related to dental care? Is, ad is, ad in is inadequate dental care the problem? Actually, when the two studies that have been done looking at dental care in horses, 72% of horses looked at in an abattoir would have benefited from dental care. And 300 horses that were looked at with an oroscope, so a telescope looking in the mouth, of these, nearly all of them had got sharp enamel edges at the side of the teeth, which are exactly what cause these, these lesions on the inside of the cheek. And a lot of these also had other more severe lesions. So overall, it has been estimated that a large proportion of horses have actually got undiagnosed dental disease, which could be significantly contributing to the oral lesions that we see in these horses. The other place that may see oral lesions is the interdental space here, which is the area between the premolars and the incisors, which also seems to, in the studies, been reported to have been in included in about 30% of racehorses or polo ponies. And in Icelandic ponies, there was an association with a curb bit for this, as opposed to the snaffle bit for the cheek. And we know that if we have an instability of the bridle or a poor fitting of the bit, we can end up with lesions at the corner of the mouth, either because the bit is too wide and unstable and moving around, or because it's too tight and pinching the edges. And if we have a poorly fitted bridle, this bridle may actually be unstable, and this has been reported previously as well. So what about bridle stability? The noseband may actually be quite important in setting up stability of the bridle, because if you have no noseband, the bridle can move around a lot more and potentially increase risk of trauma. So the noseband may be important in stability. However, the noseband is not on its own. It is part of a noseband headpiece unit. So the noseband comes around here and then goes over the top of the head in one unit. And as the horse's head goes up and down, we actually can change the length of this unit here. So if this noseband is, is in one place and the horse's head's moved around, we can actually change the pressures and movement in that area. If we have a noseband that's got a ring on the side, it can bend a little bit and move better with that horse's head. So what are the pressure points under a bridle? We thought we needed to look at this rather than just what people think. Where are they? When do they occur? What can they be affected by? And do they actually affect the horse if we change these? We looked at this in elite horses that had already got well-fitted bridles. We put pressure mats underneath the headpiece, the noseband, the cheek pieces, underneath the chin, lots of different places. And what we found is that we have areas that specifically have pressure points. On the front of the headpiece, the back of the headpiece, underneath the brow band area, on the front of the nose band, on either side of the bone, and on the underneath either side of the jaw bone. But what's interesting is that these are intermittent high pressures. These are not 
consistent high pressures. So at some points, there is no pressure under these at all. And at other points, we have high pressure. And this seems to be occurring at the point when the horse is putting a load on the ground. So when it's landing on the floor and putting a load on the ground, the nose band has an area of pressure. And when it's, it's pushing off the floor, the headpiece has some pressure. So actually, we have a, a change in the amount of time. So we can see this on this video here. So this horse, as it is cantering towards the fence, as its feet are coming on the floor, we have a pressure under the headpiece. So this is the front of the headpiece coming against the ears. We see that we have a pressure with the leg on the floor. And as the horse is in the suspension phase, it comes off the floor. And as you see, as it goes over the jump, there is no pressure at all under that headpiece. So these pressure points are only intermittent. They are not big pressures all the time. We have an up and down pressure as the horse is pushing off the floor. We see this again in trot. So in our dressage horse in trot, this is the front of the pressure mat. And you can see it's, this headpiece is rolling backwards and forwards with the stride coming against the ears and then coming back against the, um, the sides of the atlas, the wings of the atlas on the... And, and we can see we've got pressure at the front and pressure at the back. But we also have these two pressure points on either side, which are down just by the brow band. And these occur independently of the stride of the horse and are seem to be associated with the horse swallowing. Because what is interesting is that when the horse is swallowing, so these pressure points occur even when you feed a horse a polo. So you feed it polo under the bridle, it swallows and the pressure points come underneath the brow band. So the pressure points we see under the headpiece are at the base of both the ears, which we see at the same point in each stride. Um, and this is a time when we, the muscles are contracting and expanding under the headpiece. And we also see um, the area underneath the brow band here, which is independent of the bridle that we see when we're feeding them as well. This is affected by the type of headpiece. For a wide headpiece, we're more likely to have the headpiece rolling against the back, front, of the fa front of the atlas and the back of the ears. If we've got buckles on the top in one place, we get a pressure point under those. And if we have rolled bridles or a rope, then we've got a much, more, a much higher pressure point underneath that. If we have a noseband strap underneath the headpiece, which would be the traditional way of setting this up, then we get point pressure right on the top of the head. Whereas if we have a noseband strap that attaches the headpiece, if it's unstable, it'll roll backwards and forwards. So we've got lots of challenges and things that we can do to optimize what's happening. With the noseband, the intermittent high pressures we see are on either side of the noseband and interestingly are affected by where the horse's head is. So if the horse is a dressage horse with its head down and round, then what we see, then what we see is it is the pressure is on the top of the noseband. If the horse has got its head up, like a jumping horse or event horse, then we've got the pressure more on the bottom because of the position of the horse's head and where the pull is from the headpiece on the noseband. A stiffer noseband will have greater pressures to the side, but I think what's more important when we're thinking about fitting is the height relative to this facial crest. A noseband that is pushed up high against the facial crest rather than further from it is more likely to have higher pressures and actually, those higher pressures result in decreased hind limb movement. So the width of the front section, if you've got a short pace between the, the head and the facial crest, if we've got a wide noseband, we're much more likely to have pressures at the top and the bottom. And the length of the jaw pad underneath is important, because if it's too short, we're going to have pressure points right underneath those bones. And the same if we have a buckle right over the top of the bone. Noseband type affects it. So a caverson, an old-fashioned caverson or a traditional caverson, which doesn't bend at the sides, is more likely to then have some pressure points because it can't move with the horse's head. And where, the, where we've got the buckles, we're more likely to have a pressure point underneath. Whereas the crank caverson with the, with the rings at the side is actually easier for the horse that has less pressures underneath at those locations. The, a flash noseband is more likely to have pressures where the noseband is pulling down versus the headpiece and we're more likely to then get pressures underneath where we've got different aspects of it, including under the buckles. So we can, we can affect these a lot in our bridle fit. The same with the noseband, which bends, 
like a drop nose band or a grackle nose band, these can move with the horse really well and we decrease their pressures quite considerably by using those. So we looked, what happens if we pad, design a bridle that pads all these areas that we know have got pressure points? And then what happens to the horse? So padding around the headpiece, shaped back from the ears, shaped forward from the area where we, we can um, impact the bone at the back, and the bridle is lifted off by a pad from the area that we get pressure from swallowing. Also padding around the noseband. What happens to the horse? We looked at the pressure and the gait of the horses, and we found that the pressure under the modified headpiece on the modified bridle was significantly less than it was under a standard noseband, a standard headpiece, and the same with the noseband. If a standard noseband had these high pressure points during the stride, under the modified noseband, these were significantly less. So we can affect the, the comfort of the horse. And the same thing, what happens when the horse is moving? If we decrease those pressures under the bridle, we actually improve the fall in protraction, the bringing it fall in forward more, it bends its knees more, its carpi more, and its hocks more. And this is probably, we think this is because we're actually freeing up areas around, under, around the muscles around the head and allowing the horse to move and swallow better and um, move the tongue and the muscles that come down to the front leg so that actually the horse is able to move in a better quality movement. So when we're fitting the bridle, we need to make sure that we assess the anatomy of the whole of the individual horse to make sure that we are optimizing our bridle fit for each of those individual horses. For a horse with a large crest, they'll push the, the headpiece forward against the, against the ears. We need to design that or make sure that that is a shape that fits the horse. If the horse has a short mouth, we need to make sure that the, when, the, when a bit with a long shank is used, it doesn't pull the bridle forward against the ears. And of course, the hit, fit and height of the bit. Horses like us don't have symmetrical faces. Do we take that into account when we fit the bridles? We need to. This horse here, his noseband tended to slip around. When we looked actually at the shape of his face, he has got a different distance between his ear and his eye on each side. So we need to fit a bridle that suits him as well. If the horse is ideally long between the facial crest and the mouth, we've got loads of room for our noseband. If we have got a short distance, we need to make sure that noseband is narrow enough that it can fit properly rather than everything being squashed up and the noseband squashed up against the facial crest. Some horses are longer in the top than they are under the chin. We need to make sure that the shape of our noseband reflects that and the shape of the jaw band, um, the jaw pad, supports them to take it off the back of the, the, the um, jaw. So in summary, I think when we're thinking about bridles, we still need to remember that routine and tailored dental care is absolutely essential. We need to think that, realize that noseband tightness and bit type are only a small part of the whole jigsaw. And fitting the entire bridle is actually vital for the welfare of our horses. And we need to use current knowledge to guide our recommendations in bridle fit. And I think something that World Horse Welfare is really helping this is that we are in the process of putting together some guidelines specifically to help with guiding bridle fit. So hopefully that will help the welfare going forward. Thank you very much. Well, Rachel, thank you. Um, for those of us who, like me, weren't very good at tack when we were children, I, I watched that with horror, thinking of the pain I might have caused. And I just observed when my children now go to pony club and riding school, how much better they're taught. And when you teach a child what you've just explained, that it's about safety and pain, then we're all much more likely to take a real interest in tack. I, I confess, as a boy, I saw it as a, something I was just set to fail as a test. If, if someone had explained to me that it was about the welfare and the lack of cruelty to an animal, I would have taken it more seriously. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce our final speaker before the coffee break. Bronwyn Williams is a registered mental health nurse and an independent trainer and educator with a deep and long interest in equines and the psychology in particular of hoarding, which is an increasingly serious problem in this sector. Bronwyn, the floor is yours.
Your Royal Highness, Your Excellency, my Lords, Ladies and Gentlemen, it's a real privilege to be presenting at this really important conference. I've worked in the NHS for 37 years, and I've also been involved in equine welfare as a volunteer for 33 years. As a mental health nurse, I've always been interested in the connections that humans have with their animals and how these relationships can affect human mental health for good or for ill, and how companion animals can reduce or increase risks for those with mental illness. But first, I have to confirm that mental health nurses suffer from nerves just like everybody else. <laughs> so, just as being nervous is something that we can all experience, I'd like you to think about animal hoarding, not as something that happens to other people in other places. Just perhaps for the next few minutes, think about how we as individuals could come close to, be to hoarding behavior, or someone we know, or someone in our community could. Animal hoarding is a surefire way to get people's interest, including at a conference such as this, and indeed to be invited to speak at conferences. There is much interest in the subject by the media and from the general public, and it's often a source of jokes. However, those who experience the effects of animal hoarding know just how devastating it inevitably is. As some of you in this room will be aware, animal hoarding has serious consequences to the animals, to the humans involved, to the environment, and to the communities in which it occurs. Many people involved in animal hoarding live with others, and some of those hoarding animals have been found to be professionals, some working in veterinary work, and in, also in human healthcare, people who may be like us, or people that we know. Animal hoarding is more common than is generally realized. Despite this, very little research has been undertaken into it. It is different to the hoarding of objects, and animal hoarding is much more complex than object hoarding. It's very costly, and it requires a number of agencies to work together, which sometimes isn't something that we're very good at. Some of the more recent literature suggests that animal hoarding may be a type of addictive behavior, driven in the same way as addictions to substances and other behaviors such as gambling. So first of all, perhaps it's useful to have a definition of what hoarding might be. So the keeping of a large number of animals in itself is not indicative of hoarding. Rather, it occurs when there's a number of animals that are not being cared for adequately, probably in an environment that's not appropriate, and their basic needs are unmet, or they are ill and not receiving veterinary attention and treatment. Animals can be acquired through passive methods where the situation just runs away for the owner or carer. Or animals can be obtained through active methods where people go out and they seek more animals. So while there's little research, there are some proposed types of animal hoarding behavior, but it is acknowledged that these are not definitive. The three proposed types are overwhelmed caregiver. Firstly, this is where a number of animals run out of control and where owners can't look after what they already have. For example, perhaps an owner becomes unable financially or physically to continue to look after their animals adequately, and the problems escalate, often with out-of-control or indiscriminate breeding. In rescuing or mission-driven hoarding, individuals actively seek and take in animals. They can purport to be a charity or a sanctuary. Often there'll be support from others, and increasingly it would appear that perhaps this is fueled by so social media to some extent. I'd suggest to you some indicators for rescues or sanctuaries that could be possible hoarding situations. These may help us all be aware of things that things may not be as they first appear. So perhaps if a sanctuary or rescue says that there are no re a no kill where animals are not euthanized even when they need to be. Not having an upper limit on the amount of animals that can be taken in so animals are never turned away and the numbers can easily escalate. Animals come into the rescue but they don't go out no guardianship, no rehoming. And then there's exploitative hoarding, usually undertaken by individuals who have no empathy or compassion for humans or animals, and who are purely operating in order to exercise control over others, whether that be human or animal or both. There is just one mention in the literature of another type, breeder hoarders, and I'm going to come back to that a little bit later on. 
In animal hoarding, it is recognized that generally there's 100% recidivism. This means that when animals are removed, and even when individuals are banned from keeping animals, they will start seeking out animals to take in again. And often this happens on the same day as their original animals were taken away from them. So what we currently do, or have to do, for the welfare of animals doesn't work. So what research there is into animal hoarding was mostly looked, has mostly looked at small animals, cats and dogs. Equines are mentioned in passing a few times in the literature. And I was really interested. This caught my interest. Um, so I ended up undertaking a qualitative study as an independent, unpaid researcher and talking to welfare officers and looking at welfare cases where there were multiple equines and to see if these cases would match that definition of animal hoarding and many of the cases did. So I'm just going to talk you through a few of the findings from this study. In the cases reported by equine welfare officers that I interviewed that met that definition for animal hoarding, the numbers of, in the numbers of equines in cases ranged from single figures to well over 100 in several cases. I'd suggest that this range of numbers is important. The higher numbers are an awful lot of animals creating a huge demands on agencies needing to step in and pick up the pieces. But I would also draw your attention to the fact that the numbers in welfare cases can be much smaller and can still be described as animal hoarding. So basically, don't look at, this, at something and think it's, a, it's not many animals. It possibly could be hoarding. Within the cases described in my study, there were often other species of animals in addition to the equines, and also something that hasn't been identified before in the literature. There were often single breeds of equines kept in hoarding situations. Those that were keeping or breeding specific types of equines were also often keeping or breeding single breeds of other species, for example, Egyptian cats. Another key finding was the amount of psychological suffering, which won't surprise you, that was experienced by the equines involved. Prosecution in animal welfare cases tends to focus on physical suffering, not psychological suffering, which is perhaps, perhaps something that needs to be recognized. Many of the equines in the cases described were unhandled, meaning that they posed risks to anyone who needed to catch or treat them. Some owners were described as wanting their equines to live naturally, in large groups, in herds, and just do their own thing. And this was something that the general public often saw as desirable, when in fact, when we got closer and you look at the detail, animals were suffering, they were dying, they were injuring, and they were killing each other. So the owners. Generally, in this study, the owners fitted with the literature. There was the overwhelmed caregiving, those that were rescuing mission-driven, and also exploitative hoarding. But there were two new types of hoarding behaviors that came to light. The first was naive owners and helpers, people often well-meaning, some vulnerable themselves, who took on equines when they had little or no knowledge of how to care for them or any idea about what time and resources were required. They often said, that they were rescuing or saving equines. These people could also be taken advantage of by other people who wanted to offload their unwanted animals onto them. And then there was the indiscriminate breeders. So there's that, going back to that one reference in the literature that fitted with this. So those breeder hoarders. And what welfare officers described to me were the studs that would meet the definition of hoarding. And from the descriptions, of this indiscriminate breeding came something that I described as chasing the one. This is where people were breeding to obtain, for example, the smallest, the largest, the one with the most feather, the spottiest, the thoroughbred that was going to be the next winning racehorse or the next top pony, show pony. People were breeding in the hope that they would make money or a name for themselves again or to re regain a reputation that they had had decades perhaps before. With this type of driven breeding came an awful lot of wastage. Animals that didn't make the grade and were of no use. And I'd suggest that perhaps this has, this chase in the one, has that addictive quality to the behavior. So the conditions, in, 
in the cases described, there was a good deal of information about the conditions that, that the equines were kept in. There were often descriptions of different standards for different animals, sometimes within the same environment. For example, mares might be kept better than stallions or vice versa. And also something that we picked up, that where there was an emotional connection by the human to particular animals, those animals may have better care than the others. There were descriptions of animals being tucked away, hidden from sight, but also to be forgotten about, almost out of sight, out of mind. There was considerable impact on the environment in many of these cases with substantial runoff and slurry and general waste covering large areas. Dead equines were common, many left where they fell to decompose, or carcasses were hidden in sheds, or hidden in locked barns, or buried in muck heaps. One of the themes that emerged from the data was that of contained. You're probably familiar with something like this, we quite often see this in the media, with small animal hoarding and the crating of those animals in some cases. Well, this was a real surprise to me because as the officers were describing their cases, they were also describing this crating, this containment of animals. They were often kept in very small stables or areas, often small fenced areas within larger fields, or fenced in cubicles in large sheds. In some cases, animals were kept in any place available, totally unsuitable for equines. One case was a disused market garden that was uh, covered with glass, broken glass underfoot. So, this made me wonder whether we see large animals differently to small animals and how this affects the reporting or people being likely to be able to identify and report equine or other large animal welfare cases. We see animals in groups in the distance and we think it's nice to see them out and about, living well, having happy lives, and that might not actually be the case when we get a bit closer. So do we and the general public need to think differently about how we see large animals. So now I want to talk to you about health behavior change, for which there's some great evidence for an intervention known as motivational interviewing, which has been researched over many decades. It's been used successfully with alcohol and drug use and gambling and other addictive behaviors, some of the most difficult behaviors to work with. So traditionally, how do we try and change behaviors in animal welfare? as well as in human healthcare, where I mostly work. Well, we probably use some of these techniques. We might tell, we might advise, we might explain, we might cajole, we might scare, bribe, emotionally blackmail, and educate into submission. And if you go into a GP's, you may get more leaflets about how to change your health behavior than you could probably ever read. But you might recognize having used some of these techniques, traditional techniques to change in behavior with your children or maybe some other family members or others around you. That's what we do as human beings, is we tell people what they need to do. So now, I want you to think about what behaviors you might have changed. What behavior have you changed recently or in the past, even if you've gone back to it? It could be stopping smoking, it could be eating better, it could be getting more exercise, it could be reducing um, alcohol. Now think about what made you change when you made those changes? Was it any of these things done to you by other people? Probably not. Human behavior change has to be something that's intrinsic or internal to that person. Just that telling them that they need to change doesn't work. So most recently, I've been involved in delivering some training for World Horse Welfare Equine Officers and other staff. This has been a five-day bespoke course designed specifically to use motivational interviewing to enable officers and others working in equine welfare to support owners to change behaviors to improve the welfare of their animals. Motivational interviewing, to my knowledge, has never been used in this way before. Taking a training course blueprint that works in health, human health, and adapting it for those working in animal welfare. I added in some behavioral and cognitive elements to allow the skills to be used more specifically with those at risk of hoarding or currently hoarding. The project is being evaluated and will be written up for publication. So what we know so far from the training, although it only took place this September and October, some of the participants are already reporting extremely good outcomes in supporting owners and others to change their behavior. 
to improve the welfare of their animals. Some of those trained have, re have reported using the new skills alongside their already skillful interactions in working with some of the most difficult and intractable behaviours with owners, including difficult-to-reach groups and even hoarding-type situations. We know that removing animals from hoarded situations doesn't work. We know that telling people that they need to change doesn't work. So we need to find another way of working with animal owners and those who are hoarding or at risk of hoarding. Although these new interventions may not work for every situation, perhaps it shows a little hope for the future that can be of benefit to not just the equines, but also the humans involved, the environment, and their communities. Thank you very much for your time. Well, Bronwyn, thank you very much. It was a fascinating talk. And I, I don't know about you, but as I listened, I was asking myself the question, who is responsible for this? And who's responsible for tackling this problem? If you treat children in this way, which sadly does happen, ch children's social services will swing into action, and there are hit squads, and there are task forces, and there's a whole infrastructure behind it. But again, who's, re who's responsible for this? I'll just leave that with you as the question at the heart of the conference. Can I invite uh, Rachel and Anne-Marie to come up and join us? And now we'll do some Q&A. And uh, as, you're sitting, as you're sitting down, let me just say we've got two members of staff with microphones. Can you just put your hands up? There they are, two. So hands up, please, for questions. And I'm going to be quite tough. No speeches. Um, if you could say just what your interest is, so if you've got a particular hat or a role, just make that clear. And if there's a particular member of the panel you'd like to ask it, please make that clear as well. So, hands up. We've got a gentleman here. I'm going to take them in twos and threes. Any other hands? Over on this side? I feel like an auctioneer. <laughs> and we've got a second question here. Okay, gentle two gentlemen here and here. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Dennis from SPANA, um, the Society for Protection of Animals Abroad. And I just wanted to highlight two things. We do free veterinary care in 26 countries around the world, but we really, really concentrate more and more on community training and educating children, which we're actually now discussing with World Horse Welfare and merging and actually doing that in some countries together. I just wanted to give you one example, and that was I just came back from Tanzania, and this, I think, is the way to get the message across. We have community champions who are volunteers in villages, usually women, who actually advise the local people on how to better look after their animals, and I think that's the really effective way of doing it. The Thank you. The question is, do you, do you agree that's the right way to go about it? I think, is the yes, I, I think that is very definitely the way to go about it. No, no, it. I mean, you, that's the question you've for got, our panel. You've got to get the question, yeah. <laughs> Well, okay. I got it. Thank uh, you. My question is... Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, and then there's a gentleman here. I'm not sure if the, my, my name is Joe Collins. I work for the Donkey Sanctuary. Hello, Rachel. We used to work together many years ago. And I have a question for Rachel Murray that is not a Donkey Sanctuary related question. I wonder what her opinion is and whether she's done any work on bitless bridles. And I wonder what her view is about the control of horses using bridles and how much, um, how important the pressure is that, that is applied to the head for control. I'm sure you're aware there's a current conversation about bitless bridles and the safety aspects. Okay, so I've been mic'd up, which means I can rove at will. Um, two questions. Rachel, do you want to take the first one and then all three of you, perhaps the, the first question about community in, involvement? Yeah. Um, Joe, hi. <laughs> um, yeah, um, there's, uh, the, pressure, the pressure under a bitless bridle can actually be significantly greater over the nose than it, it necessarily is um, on a normal bridle. So you're not relieving pressure by using a bitless bridle. You're actually potentially increasing the pressure over the face. Um, how much pressure does it need for a horse to respond? Um, there has been... There have been one or two studies that have tried to look at what pressure it takes for a horse to respond or to learn about taking food and things like that. Um, the training of the horse will come into that quite significantly. A horse that learns on a pressure release to respond will respond with very low strains on a strain gauge, whereas a horse that doesn't understand may take considerably more. So it is, a lot of this is about education 
rather than any other aspect of it, I think, from the pressure point of view. Amory, then uh, Bronwyn. Do you want to just take, uh, I think it's Dennis's first question about community engagement? Um, sure. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I think this is probably something you can apply <laughs> across all sorts of areas. Um, but certainly within uh, equine welfare, working with the younger generations and embedding good practice and embedding a love of horses early on in lives is something that's really important. And if, if we want to do, which, which we would love to do, is to put the horse back at the center of the nation and to celebrate the horse as part of our great British heritage, then you know, having those youngsters on board, having those young people really understanding both welfare, you know, and the love for that horse has got to be the, the place to start. And doing that within a community is going to embed those sorts of good practices. And of course, one of the things I know from the work that Rowley and the team are doing internationally, it's about changing the mindset from the horse as a, as a pure asset, a machine, to a, a, an asset in the broader sense and to educate young people in developing countries to um, treat them like that. Yeah, I mean, I... I... I, I still think we have to remember that, particularly, you know, we're in a very privileged position in this country. We don't have horses doing the sorts of things, you know, helping us to survive on a daily basis that those horses are doing in other countries. But I think that if we can, um, I hate the word educate because it sounds patronising, but if we can help them understand that by looking after the welfare of their horses, they will get so much more back from them that they will be better at working and then they'll be a better, as well as a better companion and everything else. I'm sure that will be a, a very positive step. Bronwyn. Is this on? It is. Okay. I, I was, you, you were talking about children and I was thinking, I was minded about safeguarding children. Mm. And um, some of you may be aware of uh, stuff that's been done around adverse childhood mm. events um, or experiences, ACEs, and that's well worth looking at yeah. if we can equip equip young people and reduce the impact of childhood trauma, maybe then we can uh, have a, adults who are able and have the resources themselves to look after their animals better. Great. Okay, other questions? Hands up high so I can see you. There's a gentleman here on the left. Um, come on, ladies. Must be. And there's a lady there. In fact, two. Let's go gentlemen and then two ladies, if that's possible. Sir. My name is... My name is Brian Perry. I'm on the International Committee of World Horse Welfare. And I wish to ask uh, all of you, but particularly starting off with Annabelle, but we, partnership is absolutely crucial, and this has been raised by Her Royal Highness uh, 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 earlier on, and you referred to it. How about the three of you? How well do your different disciplines uh, integrate and understand the complexities of that? Uh, the the, the post-racing years, the role of, uh, of, uh, of children, and the role of understanding uh, the, the, the mental issues relating to hoarding. I, are you in little boxes, or do you, inter do you integrate these different disciplines? Great, thank you, sir. We'll, we'll come back to you, Brian, and then the two ladies there. Yeah. Yep, you're live. Do I do anything? Oh, I'm live. Um, this is a question for Bronwyn. Bronwyn, I was completely fascinated by your presentation. I'm a vet and I'm an academic working at the Royal Agricultural University, so it's not my world at all. I don't have time for your five-day course. We don't have time for it today. But could you just give us a little beginner's insight into what you mean by motivational interviewing? Lovely. Let's come back to that. And there's a lady next door while we're up in the... Hi, Claire Twelvetree from the Brook Action for Working Horses, Donkeys and Mules. It's a similar question to the woman on my left. Um, behaviour change. We consider behaviour change um, in terms of capability, motivation and opportunity. And if all three are in place, then yeah. you're likely to change behaviours. I would like your comments on that, and particularly in hard-to-reach areas where people are very poor. Brilliant. OK, so behaviour change and are we all in silos? Let's have all three of you starting... With Bronwyn. Okay, so the, I'll take the health behaviour change. Uh, it's, it's fashionable, it's big at the moment. Um, five days is, we know that anything under uh, sort of three days doesn't uh, go across into people's practice. So we do short change how we train people to work with behaviour change. Um, what is it? Well, Rawlings, uh, Rawlings and, and um, Miller would describe it as a, an intervention. It's basically about listening to people and using their own reasons and thinking 
to be the leverage for them to change the behavior. And that's, that's absolutely key. Um, and what was the other bit of that health behaviour change question? Well, I think you've dealt with that. that the one? other one was the, are okay. we in silos? Are we in silos? Yeah, absolutely. I work in mental health. This is why I'm interested that crossover and have been for years. Um, we don't, we don't recognise the importance of people's animals in mental health. And perhaps that uh, is very difficult for us to work together as agencies sometimes. Yes, absolutely. Rachel, I think you're live. I'm, I'm live. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, um, are we working together? Yes, absolutely. Um, the, the work in relation to tack fit, which we've done in relation to bridles, saddles, girths, uh, um, breastplates, a whole load of different areas. We're working with the International Equestrian Federation, the Society of Master Saddlers. We've communicated with racing. We've talked with, um, the, with um, British Eventing, British Dressage, British Equestrian Federation. Um, we, we would like to be getting this to everybody at every level. Um, but it is gradually the equine veterinary community. We've talked about it at British Equine Veterinary Association. So we're trying to work with everybody so that everybody knows it's things that we need to work with. Um, and I guess, I, you know, commenting on the, the partnership bit, I think, I think we, we do our best at the BHA to work in partnership with an awful lot of other organisations. Um, and, I, and I think that we do that on a, on a professional basis. The problem is that, particularly within horse racing, there's so much going on all the time, and we've got an awful lot of stakeholders um, across the industry. So, you know, we could probably do better at communicating and consulting. I know lots of our stakeholders will say that to us. Um, but, uh, but we do try and work across the industry, across different stakeholders, and outside it. And, and as I say, I think we can still work further and work better with um, other equine disciplines outside of, of horse racing. Great, thank you. Okay, I'm going to keep going until the starter calls me to a halt. Any more questions? Let's see if we can get take three. We've got an incredible panel here. This is your moment. There's this gentleman there, and there's a lady there, and Her Royal Highness. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure, anyone. <laughs> so let's start top right, and we'll work our way to the front, to the front bench. Hello. Hi. Pete Scargill at the Racing Post. Um, specifically to Anna Marie, Anna Marie I suppose, it's um, really talks about um, using social media, celebrity influencers, that sort of thing. Uh, racing's had to deal with its fair share of negative social media, um, advertising campaigns such as Animal Aid's um, whip campaign on the side of London buses. I just wonder if that's something that the BHA uh, was looking into using more celebrity focus and, and perhaps influences on... Great, got it. Role of celebrities in boosting this issue and campaign. Then, lady here. You're live. It's good. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Bronwyn. Um, I just wanted to ask a question. You mentioned about the papers on um, child horse, on the first um, childhood experiences. And I was just wondering if you knew or anybody else, if there's any similar research with, because um, the, the papers on adverse childhood, childhood experiences, they go back to um, development of illnesses later on in life. And so I was wondering if there's any longitudinal studies or anything going on in the equine world that are akin to that. Thank Great, you. thank you. And ma'am. Uh, very different, um, but it is about bits as part of bridal fitting. And the evidence that you showed suggested that snaffle bits are not quite as friendly as people um, like to believe. And are we kidding ourselves by everybody trying to use a snaffle as showing off how good their horses are, when actually we should, probably should be using something slightly different? Brilliant. Let's take them in reverse order. Is that all right, Rachel? If you take... And then, um, Bronwyn, if you can take the second question, and then all three of you, I think, Amory, kick off on whether we can be harnessing celebrities better. Mm -hmm. Rachel. Um, I think that's it's a very interesting question. Um, the, the study in, um, was in Icelandic horses, and so the, a lot of the snaffles they were using are not necessarily the snaffles that we would be using in our standard riding horses, and not necessarily as fitted as well. But I think there is an issue with every, every horse's mouth is an individual. So having the shape, so having the right shape and bend of a bit for that individual horse is really important. So uh, s some snaffles in some horses will not be good at all, and other ones will be fine. So I think it is more about 
rather than blaming an individual type of bit, it's more about saying, whatever bit we use, we need to make sure is fitted to that horse's mouth. And that bridle that's holding the bit needs to be stable and that the horse needs to understand what the command is being given and how to answer it. Sorry, does that answer it slightly? Bronwyn, the lady at the back. Okay, so nothing specifically about equines, but what I would suggest if you're really interested in the adverse childhood experiences is have a look at what Public Health Scotland and Public Health Wales are doing, especially Scotland. The, they have a conference each year. Their aim is to make everybody in Scotland ace aware, so that's worth having a look at. Brilliant. Anne-Marie, so the question is, is it time to call for Ben Fogel? <laughs> Can I, can I just, uh, just course, comment briefly on that last question as well? Because I think, I think this is a really important point for us. Pe people who are abusers of, of humans are often yeah. tied up with abuse of animals and abuse of other people and may have been abused in their previous lives. So actually being aware of that and actually taking the responsibility to act on it if you become aware of it is, is really important, not just for future generations of humans, but actually in terms of future generations of, of our animals. Um, in terms of celebrities, I think um, the use of social media is interesting. I think it's one um, way of communicating things. Um, there's been some great short films. I think the Michael Owen one particularly is very powerful um, and uh, his relationship with horses and with horse racing. Um, but I don't think it's the be all and end all and I think we need, uh, we need a communication strategy that, that is, is much more subtle than just using social media and celebrities. Um, it, it is about us all collectively using the right and consistent language when we talk about animal welfare, when we talk about why uh, we think that um, horses are great companions, why we feel that it's morally acceptable to use them in sport and in racing. Um, and we need that to be, uh, to be spoken um, by, our, by our trainers, by our jockeys. We've got some great, some great trainers, John Gosden, uh, you know, who we heard from earlier as uh, uh, very, very articulate um, when he talks about horses and very empathetic. Um, so, so making sure that everybody that does this uses the right language, uses consistent language, and, and you know, we can do that by uh, across equine sports as well, then I think that will be just as powerful as, as short social media snapshots by you know, the, the odd celebrity that, that may or may not come across. You know, this needs to be at every level, consistently across time, really well informed and, and just, you know, from everybody. I have to say, politically, I'd echo that. The more this is rooted in celebrating what 99% of people who work with horses and animals, equines, know in their hearts and do correctly all the time, and just calling out what bad looks like is a more powerful grassroots-based way than, than simply a celebrity campaign. I think, I think that's right. Anything to add? No. I've had the... Um, the tip from the Chief Steward uh, that it's coffee time. So, folks, can I ask you to put your hands together and thank our three panellists for... <laughs> coffee is served. Please be back in your seats at 11.45 for a sharp start. And please open your phones and get on Twitter and start making sure we're trending. See you back in 25 minutes.
Right, I think you're all under starter's orders. Everybody's in. Doors are closed. Great, well, welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a good uh, break and a uh, cup of coffee. And some of you, I hope, saw the stunning sculpture in the main hall designed by uh, Dragon's Den uh, star Deborah Meaden. Did everyone see that? Yeah, well, those of you who haven't, it's not going. It'll be here afterwards. Uh, and that's part of the charity's World Horse Trail. 40 sculptures designed by celebrities and local community artists are up for auction, and you can find more information in your program. Now, before we commence the rest of the morning, once again, I just want to draw your attention to the charity in action session later at 1.55. This is, in many ways, the, um, the, the key to this whole program. Please go and have a look at those amazing sessions. It's in the Education Centre. Now, I want to introduce our next, our next speaker, who rather fittingly will be addressing us uh, through the digital ether, because she is an 18-year-old YouTube sensation with a huge following for her inimitable brand of equestrian vlogs. Now, for those of you who don't know what a vlog is, it's a video blog, and you're about to see one. She couldn't join us today in person, but as an equestrian of the next generation, a star with huge following, she wanted to share with you her own perspective on the core issue today of responsibility. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Esme. Hi everyone, it's Esme here. Before I start, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to World Horse Welfare for very kindly inviting me here today. But also, I'd like to apologise that unfortunately I actually can't be here today, so I'm here in video format because I'm actually over in Australia working and filming there. World Horse Welfare have asked me to speak about responsibility and what it means to me. But in order to explain that, I'm going to have to talk to you a little bit about myself because I know there might be a few of you in the audience are thinking, who is this girl speaking up on stage? <laughs> My name is Esme Higgs and I started sharing my passion for horses on YouTube and Instagram back in around 2016. So with that I just posted the odd sort of video basically for myself as a video diary to track my progress with my horse Casper and from then on surprisingly my channel has actually grown to reach about 12 million views a month so with that comes great responsibility. After about a year of making videos consistently I started getting emails from my viewers being like I've started riding lessons because of your videos, I've learned so much about basic horse care, and I've also got messages from families that have moved from the city to the countryside, have bought stables, have bought ranches all over the world, and, and then it hit me that my videos were having an influence on people, so I needed to make sure that all of the content I was putting out there was letting people know that if you're going to get into horses, you need to get in for the right reasons, and if you take on a horse, you are taking on so such a huge responsibility. At the moment, there's quite a bit of negativity in the press about social media, so I thought with the opportunity that I had, the best I could, I'd try and create something positive and something with some benefit. And then accidentally and unwittingly, I sort of became a role model, which comes with a lot of responsibility. Now, I appreciate that there are a lot of people out there that want to own a horse, and with that comes a lot of time, a lot of effort, and let's face it, a bit of money as well. So with my videos, I try and put out lots of hints and tips for care, as well as showing the realities of owning a horse, all of the nitty gritty bits, me mucking out, grooming, but also with horses I try to show all of the positives such as being outside with the fresh air, having exercise and creating that indescribable bond with a horse. And then I realised that social media could be such a powerful tool to share my love for horses and I could also use this to help and promote other groups that have the same passion. So over the last few years I've worked with the British British Horse Society, the Riding for the Disabled Association, the Brook Charity, and of course, you guys, World Horse Welfare. This year, I've had great fun painting a horse, which was surprisingly popular. I also made a video about equine flu and spreading awareness with somebody you might know. And then also this year, I went over to Hall Farm to see some of the absolutely fantastic work that you're doing with horses less fortunate than mine. Over the last few years, I've been really lucky enough to go to some of the top internet national events and go behind the scenes as well as to some top yards as well and really appreciate how well these horses are looked after because they're looked after like superstars which they are. There's a new generation that's really concerned about animal welfare 
We all actually have the same view that horse welfare is the most important thing. Rather than discounting the concerns of others, we need to be accountable, we need to prove and we need to show that we are deserving of this incredible partnership with these beautiful animals. So thank you World Horse Welfare for everything that you do. I'm looking forward to the future and helping you any way I can. Thank you so much for listening and apologies again that I couldn't be here. I really hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye! Well, I think you saw something pretty special there. Talk about high energy connection. <laughs> For someone who's supposed to be in the business of connection, I'm, I think I've had my warning. Um, th there's no doubt, uh, if we're going to connect with a new generation and tell them a new story about welfare and equine welfare globally, we're going to need not necessarily celebrities, but we're going to need people with passion who are able to connect. And that was really fantastic. Thank you, Esme, for it. Now for something completely different. Roly mentioned earlier the enforcement of equine legislation as a key challenge. So we're really pleased today to have with us Inspector Dave Smith uh, from Kent Police. Dave is also the chair of the group within the police, force, police service that works to reduce equine crime nationally and who's exploring some of the practical ways that the police and others are making a difference. Dave, a very, very warm welcome. Your Royal Highness, Your Excellency, Lords, Ladies and Gentlemen, I'm suddenly feeling my age following that uh, last input. Um, I'm Inspector Dave Smith uh, from Kent Police and the National Policing Lead for Equine Crime. It gives me great, great pleasure to speak to you today about Equine Crime Priority Delivery Group and the excellent partnership work that's being done in England and Wales to both reduce equine crime and promote equine welfare. Today, I'll be advising you of some bigger picture equine facts, setting out what the objectives for equine crime are, demonstrating who helps us achieve them, asking where does responsibility lie in relation to equine crime, and lastly, giving some examples of what works on the ground. Nationally, equine crime is being taken seriously with Chief Constable Darren Martland from Cheshire Police leading the National Wildlife Crime and Rural Affairs portfolios. Launched in 2018, here's the strategic picture showing that equine crime is one of the six rural affairs policing priorities. All of these issues impact considerably upon communities far and wide. So it's reassuring to see that equine crime has been recognised as a national vulnerability to be addressed collaboratively. These priorities were selected following widespread consultation with rural communities, police services and key stakeholders, many of whom are here today. So what's the score? Why was equine crime made a policing priority? Well, there are 1.2 million horses in the UK with only half of them being microchipped. 1.3 million regular riders in addition to that. The equine industry is the second largest rural employer after agriculture. Horse boxes, trailers and tack are in the NFU's top 10 most targeted items. We've heard it earlier, in 2012 a horse crisis was declared by the RSPCA. This has continued. In 2017, the charity received 29,000 equine related calls and figures up to September this year suggest no difference, with 14,500 equine calls taken up to that point. This has resulted in over 7,000 investigations. As at January this year, there has been over 1,100 horses been taken and, re and, and taken into home in their possession at a cost of over three million pounds to the, to the charity. And current R RSPCA hotspots have been defined um, as Doncaster, Devon and South Wales and we've already had an, a, an issue with Norfolk being raised um, more recently so there are many pockets of concern. So the national equine crime objectives are to reduce equine crime including horse trailer and horse box theft, horse theft itself, tack theft, fly grazing and neglect to improve collaboration between regions and reduce cross-border equine crime, and also to encourage property marking and to work with stakeholders to do so. 
Here's a few of the key stakeholders. Sorry. Here's a few of the key stakeholders that are nationally reducing equine crime and promoting equine welfare. The British Horse Council and the National Equine Welfare Council need special mention for the excellent overarching work that they are doing in partnership with us all. So who is responsible for reducing equine crime such as theft, fly grazing, neglect, and issues of dump to die? In my opinion, it starts with owners and leads on to breeders and liveries, as we've heard earlier, who have obvious responsibilities for maintaining the safety, security, and welfare of the horses in their care. But when this doesn't occur, and identification of ownership is unknown, who's responsible then? It's at this point that key stakeholders with varying statutory and voluntary capabilities must do the right thing and collaborate in the interest of equine welfare. So what works in reducing equine crime? Yes, the good old uh, peer model is where the answers lie. A partnership approach focusing on prevention, intelligence, enforcement and reassurance will help reduce these issues, with added focus on tackling organised criminality at both regional and national levels. Words and models are great, but what work actually achieves our aims and objectives? Well, joining or working with a horse watch scheme is a must when reducing equine crime. Here are a few well-established and successful schemes that are run by either police or independent volunteers. Award-winning Carol Cottrell from Warwickshire Police runs a very successful and effective scheme, helping many others nationally by sharing her knowledge and best practice in preventing equine crime. The introduction and training of police equine officers continues nationally, with thanks to both World Horse Welfare and the British Horse Society for taking on the uh, unenviable task of educating police officers in all things equine. Such training has uh, successfully taken place in Lincolnshire, Nottinghamshire and in Kent. Thanks to Stuart Everett and colleagues at the Equine Register who are improving registration with the Central Equine Database, Digital Stable and Chip Checker facilities. Equine crime prevention evenings are held regularly to engage with the equine community at local levels, offering crime prevention advice and security marking of saddles and tack. For me, education is an essential part of any preventative work, and the British Horse Society continues to provide owners and communities with important education and advice at organised castration events. Engagement and preventative work builds trust and confidence, improving the reporting of suspicious activity and crime to police. Here's an example of police working closely with Kent Horse Watch and the equine community. All six of these horse boxes were stolen in Kent over a six month period last year by different criminals. As a result of information and intelligence received, police were able to locate and recover all six back to their rightful owners. All of the offenders were arrested, charged, and convicted of theft. Such positive outcomes of intelligence-led policing reassures communities seeing that equine crime is being taken seriously. Well, it's a known fact that fly grazing is the practice of leaving horses some, on someone else's land without permission. The NFU estimates that at least 3,000 horses are currently being unlawfully gra fly grazed in England alone. Fly grazing and neglect issues often overlap. So what's working here? To reduce these issues, partnership work with an understanding of legislation is vital. The Control of Horses Act and the Animal Welfare Act are all well known, but newer civil laws, injunctions and antisocial behaviour legislation are now being used effectively to prosecute or control such fly grazing offenders. An excellent example of this occurred in 2018 when Inspector Andy Reeves from Durham Police received over 900 reports of fly grazed horses on both private and local authority land. With some excellent problem solving skills and partnership enforcement work with local authorities, RSPCA and equine bailiffs, 
Durham has since seen a massive 75% reduction in fly grazing reports this year. The enforcement work was carried out under civil legislation, which significantly reduced the fly grazing and considerably improved the welfare of the horses removed from potential harm. A budget of £35,000 was raised between Durham Police and the local authority, which enabled this effective work to occur over the year. On one occasion, search warrants were executed at midnight with 34 horses stealthily removed and rehomed by bailiffs without anyone officially being woken up until the morning. <laughs> Preventative work in ploughing the land was introduced um, as an exit strategy with civil court proceedings and animal welfare prosecutions um, being progressed. Congratulations to Andy and the Durham Partnership for this outstanding work in reducing fly grazing and neglect. The provision of educational events are also being well, well received. Uh, both preventative education and enforcement have a big part to play in reducing fly grazing and neglect. World Horse Welfare are exploring a national green yard horse seizure policy relating to the seizure of horses straying onto highways, thus promoting safety and, continu and continuity throughout all the regions. Kent Police reviewed and improved their horse seizure policy relating to horses straying into the highways. Such horses are now seized immediately by a procured green yard scheme. Any significant health issues are addressed and unregistered horses are microchipped and registered with a passport. Where the owner is traced within 21 days, they must pay the costs if the horse is to be returned. They're also liable for prosecution. The cost to the uh, taxpayers in Kent has been significantly reduced from £260,000 for spent on seizures in 2016 down to £100,000 in 2017 and 18, respectively. Currently, eight months into this financial year, the cost stands at £20,000. So massive savings made with an increased welfare efficiency seen. Future challenges. I apologise, um, but it's an obvious challenge. EU exit with all the instability and uncertainty that that brings. Um, secondly, Central Equine Database is a great service used by responsible owners. But the future effectiveness of registration enforcement still remains a challenge for local authorities. Lastly, for me, the education of responsible ownership is a huge challenge for us all to address collaboratively. Being conscious of time, I hope my presentation has informed you all of the national equine crime priorities and demonstrated that through professionalism and dedicated partnership work, we are together shutting the gate on equine crime. Thank you. Yeah, would you like me? Yeah. Dave, thank you. Fantastic frontline policing for us. Um, we, we're running in slightly behind time, so we've got one round of questions. I'm peering into the light. Any hands up? Lady here. Anyone else will take one round, and a gentleman there at the back. And sold to the lady here and the gentleman at the back, Dave. Hold that thought, and gentlemen. <coughs> yeah, uh, David Greenwood from the Farriers Registration Council. Could I add to the list of equine crimes uh, the Farriers Registration? Sorry, can you hear me? Uh, Lancashire Constabulary this year prosecuted. I think they've brought the first state prosecution for unlawful farriery. We'd like to have a dialogue with you about how we could do more of that. All yours, Dave. Thank you. Um, Yes, and just hearing the today's speakers, I've learned so much, and um, it just highlights uh, there is a parallel uh, between um, uh, people who perpetrate domestic violence and abuse on adults, uh, again, to, adult, uh, to, to animals. Um, so there is a crossover there, and lessons to be learned that we can transfer into the prosecution of uh, welfare and, and cruelty cases in, uh, in the equine world. Um, yes, I, I, 
I'm passionate about what I do. I'm about problem solving in partnership with others. So we'll do it together in collaboration and I'm willing to take on any method uh, and look at any method to actually reduce, um, reduce the crimes. Um, so long as we achieve and, and are focused on the objective set, that is just a, a new way that we've not explored before. And it, yes, it is part of the education of officers. Dave, thank you. Can I, on behalf of everyone here, thank you, but as importantly, all the police officers around the country who are helping and doing so much work. Ladies and gentlemen, will you show your appreciation for Dave and the police? Thank you. Thank you. I don't know about you, but after that, I mean, I thought I was old when I, police started being young, but when the chief constables are starting to look young, <laughs> you're in real trouble. Um, now it's time for our discussion panel, and you may be as delighted as me that I'm handing over to um, one of our great friends, Mike Catamol, who, as many of you know, is a uh, hugely, uh, highly respected, long-standing racing journalist and broadcaster, most recently for Sky Sport ne Sports News. Mike, the stage and the microphone are yours. Thank you very much, George, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. I think we've just yeah, moved past midday. A great honour for me, uh, personally, to be invited by Roly and Jessica to take part in today's discussion, and uh, a Q&A now following with an absolutely outstanding uh, panel, uh, I'm sure you'll agree. So, I believe I'm following, here we go, we've got um, Joe Stockdale, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome Joe to the stage. <laughs> Any way you like, Joe. I'll sit at the end. Joe is our youngest panel member. He's only 20 years old. He is, of course, the son of the late and much-missed Tim Stockdale. Um, Joe is already a highly successful show jumper. He could have been a county cricketer. That's, he's just got talent coming out of every pore. It's great to see you here, Joe. Um, we've got uh, Dr. Madeline Campbell from the Royal Veterinary College, who is an expert on everything. <laughs> And lectures at the moment, I think, in human-animal interactions and ethics. Is that what you're doing right now, Maddie? Yes. Uh, amongst, amongst many other things, of course. It's lovely to see you. Obviously, you got mentioned earlier on in a connection with work for the BHA, the British Horse Racing Authority. We've also got uh, the BBC's very own Joe Wilson. Joe, welcome. <laughs> anyway. To describe Joe as an all-rounder is somewhat of an understatement. I'm sure we've all seen Joe reporting on all sorts of different sports over the years on BBC News. And we must congratulate him because just recently he's had a contract to sign with Oxford University Press to write two children's books. Fantastic. There you go. That's the pension sorted. <laughs> Congratulations on that, Joe. Um, I'd like to welcome as well um, Lindsay Stride, who's a new forest uh, commoner and Foundation for Common Land Trustee. Lindsay, you're most welcome. Thank you very much for coming up. <laughs> now, I didn't know much about New Forest Commoners until I spoke to Lindsay at length on the telephone. She told me that you're never alone when you go down and try and eke out a life on the common. Her life was mapped out before she was born because her grandparents in the 1930s left London and came down to manage um, a dairy herd and the, and the family stayed down there ever since. And you're talking about uh, being looked after on the, on the new forest there. Everybody looks after everybody else. Everybody's under their, each other's wing. Her, her husband, Rob, whose family have been there for generation upon generation, well back to doomsday times, his great-grandfather was a big, big help to Lindsay's grandparents when they arrived at the new forest. Incredible story. Welcome, Lindsay. And uh, our own, uh, well, I say our own, world horse, <laughs> Welfare Trustee Julie Ross, who is a qualified veterinary surgeon, of course. <laughs> Julie, come and sit down. She's just come back from a holiday in Bhutan, as you do. So it's a, wonder, it's a miracle that she's here at all, to be honest. But you must be feeling as though it's about seven in the evening, I guess. But welcome to all of you. Um, we've got a few topics that uh, Roly and Jessica want us to discuss at length. And we'll do each individual topic uh, in order and try and get you involved as well as we speed through. So, Joe, I'm going to start with you. Um, the question is here, what role do elite riders have in promoting appropriate training methods to, to the wider world uh, in, in equestrianism? 
Obviously, I think elite riders have a massive role to play. Um, being at the top of the sport, they're who everyone really looks up to, um, and they can have a massive influence over people because their opinion is so valued in the horse community. Um, especially nowadays with the likes of social media, they have a lot more opportunity to sort of get their, their points across uh, and get information across to the general public and those people interested. Um, and I suppose that comes with the dangers as well. I think the main point really from their responsibility is the clarity they need in the training techniques they promote. Um, it's very easy for them to talk about something that they understand and other top riders will understand. However, it could get lost in communication a bit when they're talking to, to other people at different levels. Um, so I think the point they need to put across needs to be really clarified as much as they can um, when they're saying it. So people understand and don't go wrong in their training techniques. I think it's very easy for people to be thinking they're doing the right thing and they say, oh, I've seen that top rider doing this or that. And they try and replicate that, but actually they're not seeing a lot of what's going on behind the scenes and the technicalities behind it and the way they handle the horse and all those other aspects. Do you think social media then, Joe, has really helped in I, what you do? I think so, yeah. I think it definitely has helped. Um, it's helped to get you know, um, the passion of horses across and help build the sport up as well. Um, and like I say, it, it reaches so many different areas and a wider audience. Mm -hmm. So hopefully it can grow the community a lot. I have to say, I've seen one of uh, this Esme's um, YouTube videos where she visits Joe's yard up, the, up in Northamptonshire. And Joe, you've got to run the, the cleanest yard in the country. Your father would have been very <laughs> proud. It's incredible. But uh, that's, that's one thing. Isn't it? Organisation. Yeah, um, I think I inherited all my OCD from my dad. Um, <laughs> you know, you can't go around seeing dirt anywhere. But um, I think organisation is a massive part of it. It's so complex. You're dealing with living animals and their welfare, you know, to get the performance that they need. And their welfare is top of, top of the list, really. Um, go to any top yard and the way they treat the horses, they are like elite athletes because they are. Um, and it's amazing the way that they deal with them. So I think... That, again, the organisation to be able to cope with all that and all that goes with looking after the horses is really, really important. Wait, Maddie, what I've found with, with horse racing in particular, those that aren't into horse racing, let's face it, there are more that aren't than are, but I always say to them, if, if you're not sure how well race horses are looked after, then go and visit a yard and find out that they live in five-star accommodation with servants and... It's just round-the-clock <laughs> care. It's, it's extraordinary. It's all about education, isn't it? I, I completely agree. And I was just thinking, as, as Joe was speaking, how you know, everything you're saying really ties into the themes we've been discussing this morning and the old, whole idea about the kind of social licence and you know, persuading <coughs> society that we should be allowed to continue to use horses in competition, and particularly the younger sector of society. And so obviously having people of your generation coming up in elite sport, you know, advocating good methods is really important. And then it also ties into everything Dr. Murray was talking about and you know, the, the evidence, because obviously in order to advocate what are appropriate training methods, you need an evidence base. And so it comes back to everything we were saying about needing to collaborate across the equine industries, really. From your point of view, Lindsay, is there, is there a built-in, um, if you like, education with people that uh, are brought, born and brought up in your area? Do you think that's already in people's DNA anyway? I think we mustn't assume knowledge. And we've done a lot of work in the forest um, to both communicate with commoners and with the wider public about the issues uh, that we face in the forest. Um, with regard to, to elite riders, um, my daughter and I have embarked on um, our first season of endurance riding this season. And we were very lucky enough to qualify for the British Riding Club's championships um, at the Red Dragon Ride in Wales. And... I, I cannot emphasise the importance of um, the way that elite riders um, communicate with, with us amateurs. Um, we were um, out on the ride and a, and a fabulous young rider who was riding for the Welsh team um, rode along with us for about six kilometres and she was amazing. She so um, encouraged and supported my daughter, who's only eight, and riding 36k up massive massive hills, um, was a challenge um, for us. And, and she was amazing. And so I think that inspiration that the elite riders bring to, to amateur riders is really important. Yeah. Joe, you've covered a lot of equestrian sports in your time. What, what's your overall impression on this particular subject? Well, I think like what's happened in terms of welfare in recent years is actually it's become part of the mainstream discussion. And I think 
that's had huge benefits, particularly to the horse, <laughs> but it has raised the bar of scrutiny, which I think has uh, led to challenges for the industry. I mean, I've sat in the back of this auditorium at conferences, World Horse Welfare conferences before, and been in awe of the level of expertise and experience. I can say confidently, that's not me. I didn't grow up with horses. I'm not employed around horses. But in that regard, I have a lot more in common with people outside of this auditorium than all of you esteemed people here. And I think if we're talking about responsibility, I have always felt the responsibility of the journalists, especially when you're talking about big news programs and outlets, is to provide that bridge between your level of expertise and the general opinion. And the ethical standpoint of those two groups can be really different. About 2011, I felt there were a lot of welfare stories which really demanded scrutiny and attention. Chief amongst those, I suppose, would be fatalities, especially at that time around the Grand National. But also issues like the use of the whip, the vast disparity in doping regulations within horse racing, one part of the world and the other. The easy thing for somebody in my perspective, in my position, would be to engage with an animal rights group who would give me a very emotive soundbite to say that horse racing was, by its very nature, immoral. Now, I didn't do that. What I did, in fact, was engage with Rowley and Jessica and World Horse Welfare. And the reason for doing that is because I felt if I wanted to effect some change, I wanted to talk to a group which had credibility within the industry, but was also there to hold the industry to account. Now, Rowley began today by, I think, quoting Abraham Lincoln. I think it was another later American president who said, sometimes we have to do things not because they're easy, but because they're hard. And doing that balancing act is difficult. But what I would say, Mike, is if we look what's happened, I'm looking from afar, but what's happened in Australia in horse racing this year, it seems to me that that social license that World Horse Welfare talk about is really in jeopardy because of the way now with social media, a group that can see horse racing is wrong, horse sport is wrong, can really take control of the agenda. And it seems to me that that's what's happened there, and there's always a potential for that happening anyway. So social media can be good and also very bad. I, I, think, it's, I think it's part of the point. I yeah. think it's part of it, but I think, as Anne-Marie said, it's only part of it. And I think people now with social media have reached a degree of scepticism about it and wariness. And when I've been sitting here actually thinking about what World Horse Welfare have done over a long period of time with that history and credibility, I think when people are bombarded with all sorts of streams of information which can seem like news, actually the role of some group like World Horse Welfare becomes more important, not less. So I'm handing responsibility back to Rowley. <laughs> <laughs> no bad thing. I'm sure he can cope. Uh, Julie, from uh, the point of view of, the, of World Horse Welfare, how, how can uh, getting the message out there from about training methods, correct training methods, uh, how can that be improved? Well, I, I mean, I think to, to Jules' point, the elite riders have an absolutely crucial part to play, but actually it's everyone involved in the ecosystem of these horses, so the vets have a really important part to play, the owners, the trainers, the coaches. Um, and I know as a, as a young vet, you look up to whoever's leading in your profession and look, you look up to the, the experienced vets and, and see some of them in, in very difficult moral situations where they're being... Uh, pressure that, you know, for some people the will to win does overtake what is the right thing for the horse. And I do think everybody who's at the top of their game, whether they're a rider or a vet or a trainer, has an obligation to do the right thing because there's generations coming behind who are looking to see how they cope with those difficult situations. So I think that whole ecosystem is, is really important. And the other thing, just to, to echo your point, Joe, I think we've talked a lot today about the, the lucky horses, the elite athletes, but we know there's a lot of wastage in racing uh, and also in our other horse sports where not all of these horses make it to the racetrack um, and those that do make it to the racetrack aren't always cared for the way we would hope they would be later in life. So I think it's fantastic that we're applauding the elite horses and the people who are doing amazing work looking after them, but we, we have to remember there is, a, there is a slightly darker side as well which we need to keep bringing into the light and that's where the important work of journalists is really, really important to make sure we, we keep doing that in a, a fair and transparent way. Before we move on, anybody from the, from the floor want to make a comment? Yes, gentlemen here on the, on the second row. This is Brian Perry again. Um, uh, given that the responsibility is central to this, this meeting, on uh, fine using elite riders, but on whose agenda is the message that is put over? Because elite riders may have their own idiosyncrasies, or is this a way of giving corporate messages? Uh, wh wh what does the panel think about that? Yeah, Maddie, go. 
I think it, it comes back really to what we were saying about the evidence base. So I completely agree. There's no good just having one elite rider saying this is the way it should be done and, and encouraging everyone to follow them. You know, the responsibility to be in, in the position of someone like Joe is to try and base what you're doing on the evidence. And, and that comes to the point, I think it was you who made earlier, about needing to have all parts of the industries joined up and, and feeding that evidence into the elite riders so that, that you know, they can act upon it, really. You know, what I would say, Mike, is that I think people in the VHA and people in racing would probably say, look, we've moved a long way in welfare in recent years. And there is that point, that I, which I totally get, that mm. if you remove the risk from a sport, you remove the very essence of the sport. But again, I come back to the almost unique role that World Horse Welfare would have of being covering both ends of it, you know? So they're not an advocate for the industry completely, but they'd hold the industry to account, but also has a year of the industry and an influence there. I think without that, then I think it's very difficult to actually answer your point. Mm. Well, because there is, of course, there's vested interest. Okay, are we good to move on? No, nobody else wants to make an extremely important point? Now's your chance? Nobody from upstairs yet, I noticed today. But uh, okay, we'll move, we'll move on. Thank you for, for covering that. It's a tricky, a tricky scenario. As indeed, they, all these points are in some respects. Lindsay, I'm going to pass it on to you now about the understanding of the environmental benefits of somewhere like the New Forest. How can people that don't have those benefits learn from people like you? So this was a, a really interesting question that really made me think, and, and I've talked to a lot of people in the forest about it. We, oh, I am very, very proud to turn my ponies out into the forest and know that there are um, species of, of plants and insects and other wildlife that depend on the grazed environment that we create. So we have beautiful pasture woodland, we have beautiful grazed lawns, we have wetlands, some of the, the cleanest and best freshwater habitats uh, south of the Scottish borders because of grazing. Um, I wonder how many horse keepers think about their own land and the importance of that for wildlife. I've got native ponies out on the forest. They don't suffer from laminitis. They very rarely go lame. Um, their feet are in, in beautiful condition because they're walking on a variety of surfaces all the time. Our ponies um, that we bring in, we do have to think about laminitis. We do have to think about managing their feet and their teeth because they're not leading that natural life. But how often do we think about our pastures when we think about wildlife? So, do we leave areas of grassland uh, to grow long? How often do we allow our pastures to seed, to let the grass grow long enough for the, for the pollinators? Do you ever ask, when you go and buy your hay or your haylage, which grasses are in that haylage? Do you ever ask whether that farm is under a countryside stewardship scheme? Is it being grown in a way that's beneficial to nature? Um, there are some wonderful examples of uh, farmers who produce a lot of haylage, who are working with Natural England, um, who have agreed to leave a third of their crop until after mid-July, where they have reseeded with less ryegrass and more uh, native grasses. And interestingly, their clients are now asking for the meadow hay. They're now asking to have uh, haylage that's come off of that field there because there's loads of beautiful flowers and butterflies. It makes people feel good. We talked a lot about behavior change. Um, there are so many things that we can do as horse keepers and land managers to help uh, nature, to give nature a helping hand. When I was a child, when you put a pony into livery, the mares went in one field and the geldings went in another. When that field had been eaten out, they were moved to the next field, and that field was allowed to rest. Now, while it was resting, it was also potentially home for, for hares. There were places for frogs and toads to, to wander about. Our pastures are very often eaten to, to the bone, and they're not given time to re replenish. Um, what do you do with your dung? You know, dung beetles need dung. They don't like ivermectins. Um, and, and again, in the New Forest, we have you know, a huge number of ponies out on the forest, and we don't have piles and piles of dung because the dung beetles are clearing it up for us, um, as well as all the other 
um, things. I've worked with um, lots of local schools to help local children understand the links between um, the grazing and between um, the ponies and, and the wildlife. And my favorite fungi is called Peronia punctata, and it only grows on New Forest pony poo. <laughs> <laughs> How often do you see fungi in your pasture? So fungi is a really good indicator of the quality um, of, of the pasture land and of um, the wildlife. So we need to start thinking about ourselves as land managers as well as horse keepers. And in little things like, like electric fencing, it didn't exist when I was a child. Uh, we had hedges. Hedges are also really fun to jump. Um, but we've abandoned our hedgerows, and hedgerows are really important. If you plant a hedge, within six months, you will have bats using that to navigate. In, in a year or two years, there'll be insects flying above that, um, that hedgerow, and those bats will be eating those insects. So we need to think about our responsibility for wildlife and for, for nature conservation, as well as our ponies. That was fascinating, Lindsay. It really was. Um, Thank you. I, I knew today would be very educational. Um, it continues to be. How's your little e ecosystem in Northamptonshire then, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not too bad, yeah. I, there's some really interesting points in there um, that you almost, you, have to, you almost forget about a lot of the time, I think. Um, but, you know, coming from our experience, we try. It's, it's difficult sometimes if you are limited on the amount of land you have um, to use, but... Like you say, you have to try and rotate and give, give that land an opportunity to then grow back and, and come back stronger from, from the grazing before. So it's definitely something that's really vital that a lot of people wouldn't even take into account when they are putting their ponies or horses out to graze. It's, it's something that really needs to be highlighted, I suppose. And I, I guess, it, well, as we've heard about the new forest, it's a special part of the world, Maddie, isn't it? It, must, it varies all over the land, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I'm very lucky, lucky I live on the Ashdown Forest, actually, so we were having a chat in the coffee break about conservation and using ponies for conservation, you know, and, and it is fascinating to hear more about it. I suppose, you know, the answer to how is my ecosystem is at the moment, it's really, really wet. And, you know, and that makes it difficult to, to do all those kind of aspirational things you're talking about, I suppose, in real life. Interestingly, um, it's the wetlands of the New Forest that some of the most precious habitats and ponies are really, really good at grazing those wet, those wet places. Yeah, um, so, yeah, ponies and, and wet places can go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Has anybody got any comments on the floor about uh, Lindsay's ex his extremely informative talk there? Anybody want to add to that at all? Okay. Yeah, there's somebody upstairs. Fantastic. I can't see who it is. Somebody in the glare... Oh, yes, got you. Second row. Thank you. That, thank you. Uh, Mary Smith. Um, I'm a self-employed vet, formerly a resident near Salisbury, so I do have a bit of familiarity with parts of the New Forest um, in a previous job. Lindsay, I, I'm really interested to hear your opinion on whether parts of the New Forest are overstocked and where you may have seen, as a result, a reduction in some of the wonderful things that you've described. Do you have a feel for numbers of pony per native acre of land, and whether or not you could pass on that sort of advice to some of the livery yards or, or, or other parts of the UK where there isn't the luxury of so much open space to try and help us understand better how to balance grazing versus restoration of habitat? It's, it's a really interesting question and a really interesting point. The beauty of the New Forest is it's so large and we have very um, fluctuating grazing patterns. And actually, some of the tightest grazed lawns are some of the most precious for biodiversity. So we're very lucky that the forest has been studied over so many years and the flora and fauna are, are well understood by the local conservationists and, and specialists. So actually, a de you know, 20 years in the life of a forest is a very, very short amount of time. And grazing pressure actually um, benefits different species at different times. So 
we don't worry too much about the, the, the numbers of animals that are out, because that will change. In the 1980s, numbers dropped very, very low, and that obviously benefited some species over others. Um, it's very difficult to say how many animals you should be turning out in, in one particular place, because every place is different. Um, small fleabane can only be found in the New Forest. Um, and it's only found close to commoners' holdings where they turn cattle out on a regular basis. Um, so that requires really high um, densities of animals, whereas there are other parts of the forest that are almost ungrazed. So um, not a very good answer for you. I can't give you a, a, an exact answer. The reality is every single area of land is different um, and needs to be managed um, sort of personally, really. Thank you. It was a great question. Thank you very much indeed. Um, okay, somebody's got an urgent call coming through. <laughs> Answer it now, I would. Uh, we're going to move on, I think. We're going to move on to our next uh, topic, which is about equine influenza and vaccinations. I'm going to throw this one to you, Maddie. Um, reputedly, there's around about 30% of uh, horses in Britain vaccinated against equine influenza. How can we improve this, and how can, how, how can the veterinary... Um, society, if you like, or the group of, of vets around the country, how can they Im improve the uptake of this? So, I mean, it's something we've talked about several times already this morning, this influenza outbreak, and I definitely think there is a role uh, for the veterinary profession in engaging with horse owners and um, providing information about the transmission of the disease, its health and welfare impacts, uh, and about what we can do in terms of biosecurity and vaccination to try and um, reduce um, the spread. Um, one question, of course, is, is about price, and, and would we increase uh, uptake of the vaccination if the price was reduced, and if so, whose responsibility is it uh, to reduce the price? And my personal view is I don't think it's the responsibility of the, of the veterinary profession as a whole to, to discount uh, prices, although, of course, individual practices may decide to have a kind of policy within their area. Pharmaceuticals? Yeah, yeah I mean, that's, you know, if it's not vet's responsibility, then whose responsibility is it, I suppose, is, is one question. And, and you might think it's pharmaceutical companies' responsibility in the face of a national outbreak. Um, my own view on that is that we have always to bear in mind that the cost of any drug or vaccine reflects not only the cost of having got um, you know, that drug or vaccine to market, but the cost of all the ones that didn't get there that the companies have tried to develop. And so they have to be allowed to charge a reasonable price. Mm government, I suppose, is, is the other thing, you know, in the face of a of national outbreak of disease, should government be subsidising uh, vaccination? And have, you know, my answer to that is if, if it was a, an outbreak of disease, uh, which either was something really new, something exotic for which, for example, a vaccination hadn't been available, uh, then that might be reasonable for the government to get involved. Or if it was something that was, for example, a zoonotic risk going to impact upon human health or the human food chain or something like that. Nice. But the reality is that equine flu isn't. It's a disease that's been with us a long, long time. It's something which owners have had an opportunity to vaccinate against. Um, and so I think the vet's role really is in, in helping owners to understand why part of responsible ownership is undertaking preventative health care measures. Is there, I'll throw this one to you, Julie, is there a natural resistance being built up, do you think, by the British equine stock against equine flu? all the time and, yeah. and you know Maddie is much closer to this than I am but but flu is changing and a, and a lot of the vaccines that we that we have are actually quite old now so there definitely is a responsibility on the pharmaceutical industry to keep those vaccines as up to date as possible um, and I think that's where their responsibility lies to invest in in that research and development but the, the flu is changing every year so we need the the natural immunity, but we, we need to keep vaccinating every year with the most up-to-date strains of flu, so we've got the best levels of protection that we possibly can. And, and I think, I mean, vets have such an important role, but increasingly people are turning to Dr. Google for their, their health and um, welfare advice. And, you know, I think that's unfortunate because generally vets are the people with the most up-to-date knowledge and, and information, but we have to accept that horse owners are consumers and we should be talking to them in a way that resonates with them. Um, and, and unfortunately, just talking about science and facts isn't, isn't always the right way. So if you Google, and I did this this morning, um, should I vaccinate my horse against flu? Actually, the first page of Google comes from really quite reputable sources, which is very, very good. But when you read through it, it talks mostly about, well, these are the FEI requirements. This is what you should do. 
And if I'm, you know, Missy Smith with two happy hackers, that doesn't really apply to me. So we potentially we should be thinking not about what we're telling people, but how we're telling them and how we're encouraging them to do the right thing. Um, and in companion animal medicine, we've seen really great success with loyalty schemes for vaccination. So most of you who have dogs or cats will probably have been spoken to uh, by your vets about various health plans that they can be on that give you some level of discount. But the dogs on those plans, there's a 90% chance that they are vaccinated every year versus a 50% chance in the rest of the population. So applying these consumer-focused mechanisms to things like vaccination does work. Um, and you know, potentially there's more that, that the equine industry could be doing to try and use these consumer techniques so that we're talking to people in a way that really resonates with them rather than just, if you're an elite rider, you should do this. But what about, what about everybody else? Right. Speaking of elite riders, Joe. Uh, you must have a deal with your local vet. What, what, uh, <laughs> how, often, how often do you, do you inoculate your, your string? Uh, well, we, we have a really good system in place that we have. Um, we'll have each horse is sort of put in a block that then they all get vaccinated at the same time. And what that means is that none of them get missed. Um, and obviously for us, like we were saying, it's so important for the international competitions that we need them vaccinated every time and they need to be up to date with their vaccinations. I suppose what you could say is that the focus should be taken off of the fact that you need the vaccinations for the, for the competition and for the international stage, and more on the, the health benefits of the vaccinations rather than it all being about yeah. you know, applying to the rules and, and fitting the regulations that you need to be able to compete. It should be more on the, the, the health and welfare of the horse instead, and maybe that would increase you know, the amount of numbers that, that people did decide to get vaccinations for their horses. Very good point, yeah. Um, slightly off track, but I want to bring it in, Joe, because uh, were, were you involved in the story that when British racing uh, was halted uh, briefly a few months ago, wasn't it, because of the outbreak of, of equine flu? You know, Mike, I was just thinking of that, actually, that this is a really good point about, in some ways, what you're talking about, about the specifics of how to deal with this is a day-to-day -day issue for people who keep horses, who work with horses, and then suddenly, for 48 hours maybe, Mike, it was the lead story on the news, mm -hmm. because suddenly it was closing down the day-to-day -day, uh, operation of horse racing. That reveals that horse racing is still very much part of our social fabric, I think. But it also demonstrates the need for the governing body and the sport to actually communicate. I think, and Amory has gone, hasn't she? It's a shame, because I think the BHA did a pretty good job. <laughs> I think they put themselves forward. I spent a lot of time just doing interviews and getting people in the right place to make that, get that message across. But it's absolutely an example of what would seem like a very industry-specific issue could suddenly become the topic of discussion on general media, on mass media. So I, I often think that racing, the way it approaches media, it has its own me media world. Mm in some ways very well served with the rolling news channels of the TV stations, its own daily newspaper, no other sport has that. Mm. But it's then how do you present your sport and your issues to the general big audience at those key times in a year when suddenly everybody's interested. How does it work in the new forest, Lindsay? So it, it's, it's really important um, to protect our native um, pony herds that recreational riders and other riders who come into the forest, for example, are vaccinated. So um, it's interesting, all of our ponies are six months vaccinated so that we can go to different pony club venues. Um, so that, in, in a way, venues insisting on it is a way of enforcing um, for those people who choose not to vaccinate. Um, our ponies, New Forest ponies, have, have gone onto the rare breed list because we've restricted uh, the number of stallions so significantly to reduce uh, the number of foals being born. But therefore, an outbreak of flu would, would devastate our, our herd of ponies. But the viability of, of vaccinating ponies that run the forest, um, it, it, it's just not possible um, because so many ponies um, go uncaught for you know, a long, long periods of time. Um, but it's, it's vital to us that, that all those riders who, who enter the forest have ponies that are vaccinated. Mm. Thank you. Um, team, out on the floor, it's your turn to participate on this particular topic. Anybody? Yes, there's a lady at the front here coming to you. And at the back as well. Great, I'll um, come to you in a moment. To, yeah. so if you'd like to go some, first, my love. I'm, I'm a member of the Parliamentary Horse Committee when Parliament is sitting. Uh, 
I have a Highland Pony stud up in North Yorkshire, and I was wondering if foals should be vaccinated, and if so, at what age? Okay, thank you. Um, should we get this lady's question as well while we're up to, we can... Hello. Hello, there you Hello. go. Hello, um, I'm uh, Clara Savile at the Brook, and I just thought it was worth highlighting situations where animals aren't vaccinated, um, and whether this is uh, perhaps one of the things that could add to the human behaviour change to encourage people to vaccinate. There was a recent outbreak across West and Central Africa of equine influenza. That is an almost completely naive, um, unvaccinated population because the animal health systems are so weak that they don't have access to a, a, a vaccine, the animal health practitioners to administer it, the cold chain and what have you. It was a devastating outbreak where hundreds of thousands of animals, predominantly donkeys, um, died. So it's worth reflecting on how lucky we are in this country to have um, the, the systems that exist to support mm. adequate vaccination. Thank you very much. Um, what about, um, oh, there's a third question there. Yes. Another late, there's a fourth one too. Great. Keep them coming. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Freeman from the University of Nottingham. I'm, I would like um, to propose, and your opinion, that it, the vaccination responsibility comes down to the organisations to have an agreed policy, where we have Pony Club that have 12 months plus two weeks, or racehorses eight months, and other organisations six months. We're sending out a confused message to our clients, which will then default to the longest period of time. And so actually take it off the equine vets, put it back on the organisations to have a coherent um, message. Mm, thank you. One more. Thank you very much. Uh, David Mountford from the British Equine Veterinary Association. Firstly, I think we shouldn't underestimate the task. If we look at Australia, where there's a pretty nasty disease called Hendra, which kills horses, but also kills vets who treat the horses and kills trainers and, and grooms, there is, a, there is a vaccine available for Hendra virus, and yet the uptake in Australia still remains challenging because people don't want to vaccinate their horses against this disease, which could kill them or their vets or their horses. Um, so that we shouldn't underestimate the challenge is my first point. The question is, and it relates to Sarah's point in terms of leadership, two of our three Olympic disciplines chose to ignore advice from the Animal Health Trust and ignore the lead that the BHA took in terms of implementing a six-month vaccination policy during the outbreak this year. I don't know what the panel's views on that are. Joe, what was, what was going on with the show jumping world during that time? What um, was the reaction? Obviously, everyone was quite uh, concerned about their own horses, especially those top ones. Um, a lot of people stopped going to local shows just because of the danger of you know, meeting a horse that wasn't vaccinated or yeah, what have you. Um, so, so I think from, from a rider's point of view, there was a big concern, but it doesn't necessarily stop people with less of an understanding and, and maybe less knowledge of, of the dangers of it. Um, so again, I suppose that comes back down to education of, of the importance again. What about um, inoculating as a foal? Yeah, so, um, you know, obviously any vaccination program depends, depends upon the particular circumstances, and at the moment we're in unusual circumstances. But as a, as a general rule with vaccination of foals, um, in horses we get what we call passive transfer of immunity in the colostrum when the foal drinks. So what that means is if you vaccinate the mare then protection will be passed to the foal. They'll take on some of the antibodies and the colostrum. So it's always a good idea to vaccinate uh, pregnant mares in about the last six weeks to month or so before to give them a booster before they foal. And, and that will then provide the foal with some protection yes. uh, for a few months. And, and then we need to vaccinate the foals from then on. And when exactly we decide to do that, you know, normally one would say follow the manufacturer's recommendations. Um, but we might need to look at that in the light of what's going on in the country. It would vary, I guess, Yeah, wouldn't it? I think so. Yeah, yeah. OK, um, we'll move on to our, our final point, um, which I'm going to throw open to, to Joe first of all. The question is, in an increasingly polarised world, which it is, Joe, isn't it? The world has become very polarised. Does the media tend towards highlighting the extreme views on equine welfare issues rather than the mainstream view? What is the mainstream view, do you think? <laughs> well, it can do, my God. <laughs> I'm sitting here feeling very balanced. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is kind of the point that we touched on earlier. I, I do think there is, a, there is a danger with that. What I would say is that, uh, I mean, 
Holding the BBC up to scrutiny is as much a national sport as horse racing, isn't it? <laughs> and we embrace that. But, and, and there are great strengths and the weaknesses to the BBC, and I can say that having worked in it in virtually every kind of role for 25 years or so. Mm. But one thing that is ingrained in you as a, as a journalist working for the BBC is that balance is absolutely at the heart of you know, if you've been criticised from both sides, you've probably got it right. Now, that sense of balance is just not there in the jungle of social media. There's some great people who are doing it there, but the, clearly the motivation is if you're presenting yourself on social media is to get clicks, is to get attention. So marrying up those two things is, is very difficult. Um, and it's not going to be solved in a two-sentence tweet because a lot of these issues are very complex and, and require that. I think... What I guess I would suggest is for people involved in the industry is to try and maintain a relationship of trust mm. with journalists who actually are independent and responsible, because there are a few of us out there. <laughs> and I think the other point is, just to end with, I mean, I think there is a, there is a feeling amongst a lot of people I've heard speaking to that really should be emphasising the positive that comes uniquely with, with horses in sport, and I think the most moving sporting event I've ever covered was in 2012 in Greenwich. Not the Olympics, but the Paralympics mm. equestrian. When you had a full house and some of the people with the most severe physical disabilities and impairments competing. And they told the crowd there, many of whom had never been to an equestrian event before, when the dressage test is finished, please don't clap. Because if you do that, it might startle the horses and the rider wouldn't be able to cope with that. So instead they waved. So then you had a full auditorium of people waving. Mm. And it, I've never seen anything like that before. Yeah, yeah, but it was fantastic. fantastic. So there is this uniqueness that comes with horses in sport, as well as the challenges. And I guess anything that you people can do to emphasise that will just help the bond of trust with the general public who only engage with horses in sport a few times every year. It's all about education, Julie, isn't it, I guess? It's what we're trying to say here. Um, but there are always going to be extreme pressure groups, such as like, animal aid, for example. I think there are, and I think the, the media is such an important channel for, for people like, like us at World Horse Welfare to get our messages out. Um, but when there is extremist viewpoints out there, it, it can really sway public opinion. And so there's a huge responsibility, I think, on the media to reach out to balanced organisations. And I think Rowley has done an amazing job at this over the, the last few years and, and of, of trying to be the spokesperson who people can reach out to for, for a balanced view. And I think my ask of the media would be to go to that balanced viewpoint before reaching for that immediate soundbite. Um, one thing that happens in the, in the US and there's many, many problems with US horse sports, but they have um, a system called a AAEP On Call, where, where every televised equine event has a media-trained, very experienced veterinary surgeon who is just there to talk to the media. So uh, if any of you remember uh, about 13 years ago when Barbaro fractured his leg uh, on camera, and I was working in the US at that point, catastrophic injury, but there was immediately a media trained vet who could give a very balanced view of what was happening to the public and it stopped some of the kind of extremist views um, kind of getting blown out of proportion. I think World Trust Welfare does play a really important part of doing that in the UK but we potentially we need more of that where there's people just there to give the facts about what's happening rather than letting um, more extremist views start to start to filter through. Yeah, I think if I think about the first Grand National I've covered as a very junior producer, I think probably 97, I think two horses died then. And that, I think the names of those horses might have been mentioned, almost mumbled as the closing credits ran. Yeah. Now, at that time, there wasn't an alternative media source. <laughs> you know, now there is. So there is no room for silence because somebody else will fill it. I suppose that's the point. What are your views, Lindsay? It's something, and, and that notion of silence, silence isn't possible anymore. And, and with silence comes um, a sense of, is someone doing something wrong? Um, so in the forest, we've worked really hard to, to tell our own story, because actually, good news isn't news. And you have to make it your own news. So that is a really positive thing of social media. And, and we now have a, a number of, of commoners, particularly young commoners, who are telling the story of the forest and, and telling the story of, you know, the benefits that grazing brings um, to the landscape, um, but also helps the general public understand their responsibilities. So we've got a, a simple campaign, which is add three minutes, where we want drivers to drop their speed when they drive across the forest. 
Um, all of those things um, you can do yourself now, which you couldn't before. And, and whilst our, our local BBC have been, have been really good, um, it's easier sometimes to tell your own positive story. That's a, a, great, uh, a great summary. Anybody want to add to that before we finally, there's a gentleman at the top? Oh, it's a lady at the top, sorry, got you. <laughs> he had the microphone to you. What would you like to say? Society for Recreation Science. Um, and I want to challenge the panel because I think you're dead right that we have problems. If you take racing, for instance, the media and the public are very concerned about catastrophic fractures, about whip use. But actually, what is important to the horse? A lot of people today have said that the elite horses, whether they're sport horses or race horses, have some of the best lives available. They're so well looked after. And in many respects, they are. They have the best health care. Um, their stables are immaculate. But again, what is important to the horse? And we have very good evidence now to show that we talk about the three Fs, food, friends, and freedom. These are the ethological needs, which if the horses don't receive them, has a negative impact on their quality of life. So they need to chew, probably for around 16 hours a day. They need access to other horses that they can mutually groom and interact with. And realistically, they need turnout to be able to run around and roll and jump. So who is responsible, this is my question to the panel, who is responsible for the challenges that we face, which may have a big impact on the horse's quality of life, but may not be in the public eye at this point in time? Okay, thank you, Gemma. <laughs> Over to you, Maddie. I think that's an interesting question, and I was thinking along the same lines, actually, as I was listening. To Joe, so you know, I agree absolutely. We need to be putting across a balanced uh, point of view, but but equally, I think we we all have a responsibility always to be challenging ourselves about our own preconceptions about what we have historically done, and we need to be stopping and thinking. You know, given the new evidence that's coming through about behaviour and, and so forth, is that the right thing to still be doing, or in fact, do we need to sit back and, and readjust what we're doing? And, and I think for all of us who care about the welfare of horses, that's a, a constant challenge to be looking at critically at how we're doing things. Thank you. Julie? I, I, I would agree. And, and I think uh, our, our elite equine athletes are mostly cared for very, very well. But I would argue that some of the practices that you see where animals are um, cooped up for 23, 22 hours a day, they're not getting outside. Uh, it might look nice on the outside, but it's not the right thing for the horses. And I, I agree with Maddie. I think everyone in the ecosystem has to be challenging. And it's fantastic that there's evidence-based research coming out that then allows us all to, to challenge some very traditional methods that are accepted as the right thing to do. But we need the evidence to prove whether they are or not. So it's fantastic that that work is, is happening. Thank you. I think we can definitely learn from New Forest Ponies. <laughs> <laughs> they eat a right. lot of gorse and a lot of holly. They browse, they graze, they, they, they go where they want to go. And I was talking to my husband about it. You know, what was I going to say here today? And he said, forest ponies are happy ponies. When we get our mares in, they don't want to be in. They walk and walk and walk and walk um, the field boundaries. And... And usually when they, you know, they're in perhaps because the foal has to be weaned or, or something, um, that moment when you open the gate, the joy, that forest mare is watching that gate and she comes and she, out she goes and it's a magical moment. Um, and there are lots of things we can do to give our, our ponies at home what our ponies on the forest have. So little things, it's good for nature too, put some logs in your field. The ponies can scratch on them, they can walk over them. Um, and, and so there's some simple things that we can do um, on, our, on our farms and on our holdings that give ponies those, those needs. Thank you. Um, there's a big clock here which says 13.09, really, and I've, I've a funny feeling we're coming towards the end of our... So just one or two more points, if I may. There's, there's two or three hands being raised. Yes, madam, you first. Um, Heather Maggs, PhD student again. Um, picking up on the phrase extreme views and equine welfare, may I ask the panel's views on, not so long ago, climate change activists were 
viewed as extreme, and I think you could argue they're now moving into the mainstream. And if we take the focus now to welfare of equines, humans, the planet, and any other species, what is the long-term sustainability of the international arm of shipping horses around the world and contributing to um, um, increased climate change gases? Wow. <laughs> I'm going to throw that one over to the panel. <laughs> um, Julie, uh, come on. Bring, that, that, I'm sorry, that is a real curved ball, no, which I've deflected think, to you. I think it's a great question. And it's I a think wonderful question. We're all having to reassess everything that we do in our lives uh, as to why we fly, why we eat red meat. So it, absolutely, it's something that we should, be, we should be considering. I suspect when we look at the contribution to emissions of transporting horses around the world, it's a very small part, but that doesn't mean we can't do it better. And actually, there's a, uh, uh, so the recent FEI show jumping event in Finland, they generated the electricity for that whole four day event from horse manure. So the manure of 350 horses, roughly, was used um, and they not only produced all the electricity for that event uh, with the manure, but they also heated 28 apartments in Helsinki for a month with the electricity generated. So I think we need to, rather than just stopping things, we need to think about how we do things differently and become really innovative. So potentially there is more that our horses can do for the environment than, than just the pasture land, but excellent question. That sounds like a topic for next year, really. Um, yeah. Joe, what would you well, like to say? All I would say on the basis of that, Mike, the piece that I've been working on, which has gone out today, is about a new league table which actually lists our Premier League football clubs in order of their environmental impact. So it's 100% yeah. an area. And if you're looking at progressive stories which will attract a bigger audience, if racing and the horse industry as a whole can prove that it has integrity and is leading the way in these areas, it's a way of getting positive attention because it will be on the agenda 100%. There was a lady in the corner here, I, I just, yes. D have you got the, yes, there we go. I saw your hand up just now. Following a recent social media outrage, sponsorship was withdrawn. Was that a balanced thing to do? What was, what was this? A showing producer had a clip um, which showed um, a horse perhaps not in its best state, so the sponsorship was withdrawn from that person. And I'm just wondering if that was a balanced thing that the sponsor should react so quickly to that social media clip. Was it, you're not talking about Taylor Swift, the singer who cancelled her gig at the Melbourne Cup, or is that something similar? No. Oh, do, do you know what this is, Joe? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. It's gone way over my head. I do apologise. Joe, go on. Yeah, do you know I, what that I, is? I do know what you're referring to. Um, I think it, it's a really, really tricky one. Uh, to sort of answer that because it's not really for us to say but I can see it from both sides how obviously it's very difficult for that person who has lost such a big sponsor for such a long time um, but then again I think from the sponsor's point of view they've got to look at their image and nowadays with social media they it's very easy to associate people together um, and I don't want it to be on my head on, on this opinion but um, Either way, I can see why, why they did it and I can see their reasons behind it because it does reflect back on them as, as the main sponsor. Um, and the clip may be, you know, in this state, like we say about social media and, and how much influence that can have and how widely spread that can have and how um, opinions can sometimes get blown out of proportion, I think it probably was an acceptable thing. It's difficult to say acceptable, but... I can see why the sponsors did it, because there, there was a reason behind what they did. Whether that was right or wrong is probably not for me to say, but um, it's a very difficult situation to be dealing with that. Thank you. Um, great question. I sort of understood it in the end. I wasn't aware of that, Joe. Very good. Is there just one to go, is there, girls? <laughs> It'll come. It'll okay. come. Um, Penny Sanders, um, the Mrs. France Hayhurst Foundation. Um, I was just going back to the previous comment from the lady upstairs and the welfare of horses and the three Fs um, and focusing on the last one, which was freedom. Do, I live near two um, probably very well-known riding schools, stables. It doesn't occur to me that they have an awful lot of freedom other than being trotted out by inexpert riders. 
is there a query above the welfare of those horses, do we think? Uh, at riding centres? Yes. In particular? Yes, R riding schools, you know, uh, let's say urban riding schools. Mm. Well, they wouldn't have as much freedom as they get in the New Forest, that's for sure. Um, Maddie, would they? No, clearly not. Yeah. You know, and, you know, you're quite right. You know, the more we learn, the more our aspiration should be that horses are allowed to, to have at least some time each day outside. And, and in some countries within Europe, in fact, you know, for various species, those kind of things have become uh, legislative requirements. I, I suppose... The, the practical problem is it's not only riding school horses, but it would also be true, for example, of horses working in London in, in various roles, that you just can't always um, provide that. And so then we have to look for ways you know, to organise it at least every now and then as best we can and, and perhaps to provide for the horses' needs, um, you know, the needs which would normally be fulfilled by being outside roaming in other ways. But, uh, you know, one would aspire to that, certainly. Everywhere is different. That's yeah. it. Fantastic. It's all about responsibility today, ladies and gentlemen, and I think you'll agree that we've had a really responsible panel. Um, so uh, thank you for listening. My thanks to Julie, to Lindsay, to Joe, to Maddie, and to Joe as well. And uh, thank you indeed for your attention. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> well done, mate. Top work. Well, thank you, Mike, and all of the panellists. We're a completely fascinating conversation. I was particularly struck by the issues that underpinned what you were saying about accountability and visibility and responsibility. And the truth is, once you're aware of something is going on, I think you're responsible. And I just said this as the Minister for the Future of Transport. Drone technology and satellite technology is going to allow us to start to see things that might hitherto have been invisible. And when we start as a society to see maybe cruelty out, uh, out of normal view, we're going to, as a society, start to have some responsibilities to work out how we deal with it. There's some really fascinating issues there. Now, it, it's my huge uh, privilege and um, pleasure to introduce our next speaker, the president of World Horse Welfare, uh, somebody who has more experience of the issues we're talking about than probably any of us in the room. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please give a very warm, warm welcome to Her Royal Highness, the Princess Royal. Thank you, Tom. Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen. Well, uh, thank you very much for making it uh, at such a, uh, an excellent uh, event here. Uh, choosing the word responsibility was always going to make it pretty interesting. But I, I, there was one thing that struck me, and has been worrying me ever since one of those contributions, was how many husbands and fathers think that their wives and daughters are already hoarders? <laughs> Be very careful how you define that particular discussion. Um, but I suspect there are one or two who are going out there, yeah, I know, I know a hoarder. <laughs> <laughs> but the definition, isn't it? It's the definition of hoarders, the definition of responsibility, which you were just looking at and hearing about. Um, it's one of those issues that, uh, to me, care is not an academic subject. Care is something uh, you respond to and you do. Uh, not, you can't... You don't, get taught to do it. It is something you respond to. And I do wonder if responsibility you know, it comes under the same heading. It's not really an academic subject. Uh, it is something people sort of inherently understand what the word means. But there is an importance in being able to define it with a bit more clarity in certain areas. And yet what we've been hearing today also shows us how difficult that is to do because the various interested parties will all have a slightly different area of what they define that they are responsible for. Overall, you have to argue that that is the person who actually owns the animal, that at the end of the day, they are truly responsible uh, for that particular uh, equine. And that probably is where you ought to start 
that definition. And that responsibility is, is, then becomes over a very wide area in terms of what they do with that horse, uh, how they respond to it, uh, both at the time and in its, in its long-term future. I think the ability to recognize horses' talents and how that fits with yours is part of that responsibility. In some respects, racing is relatively straightforward. It needs to go faster than the other horses around it. It's a pretty basic requirement, and most horses quite enjoy that. I mean, they are inherently, in, in the herd concept, uh, quite competitive, and it's quite easy to tell whether they're going to do that or not and how well they're going to do it. Uh, some of them are more mentally better attuned to doing that on a regular basis than others. But there are other horses who really, they don't want to show, they won't race, but they like showing off. They, you see those in, in other areas of equine sport, and they are genuinely show-offs. They respond to an audience in a way that you wouldn't expect a herd animal to do. And our partnerships with horses, I think, have changed that relationship in many respects. You've been talking about grazing and the time out and the freedom that they need to um, exhibit their own national traits, national, natural traits. But I know horses that hated being in fields. When they were retired, they, like some people, they just gave up. They enjoyed being part of that partnership. Work was part of their natural life, and they enjoyed being part of that. But it is identifying those particular horses' talents and skills that is just as important. And it is quite a challenge to link that together with the social media approach, at which there's so much information out there. Is that information knowledge? Does it translate into wisdom? Does it give you the skills to work with animals? However much you may like the idea uh, of having horses or working with horses, can you get that simply by reading, studying, or getting advice from the social media? That's quite a challenge for the humans, never mind how the humans relate to um, the horses themselves. And perhaps the greatest difficulty that we have, maybe that's through social media, maybe that's through the availability of information and uh, an expectation of perfection in not just our health terms, but in perfection of all our relationships and the expectation of perfection in the, in the welfare of animals as well. That doesn't allow for gray areas, doesn't allow for variation, um, there are never any accidents, of course. It's just, you know, it's, it's a willful damage one way or the other. Somebody's responsible. We know that with animals, the longer you have them, the more you realize that none of those things uh, uh, you can guarantee. And you absolutely cannot um, guarantee there are no risks. By definition, animals of all sorts, and in some cases, particularly horses, are a risk both to you and to themselves. Uh, we know that because, although I don't know that the vets do these figures, uh, we can measure the, the amount of damage that is done in a sporting environment, and yet most of the damage, I suspect, happens in fields and when left to their own devices. Um, anybody who's owned horses who, who decides to put them out in the field will um, recognize that this is probably true. Um, there is, there is no way you can have a no-risk environment for anything to do with animals. And I don't think humans can live in that world either. It's not a realistic uh, expectation. But the responsibility for making as risk-free as possible is a slightly different issue. So understanding the risks, and it is really about understanding the risks, uh, will make it possible to reduce some of those um, the, the, the worst sides of having that relationship with horses and taking them out of their natural environment, which humans have been doing for centuries. And many horses have no real recollection of being a herd animal in any shape or form, because that breed has been bred for a very specific reason. It hasn't been for living with other horses. It has been for its relationship with people. And that was increases the responsibility on humans to do that appropriately and for the right reasons. 
But I found this morning really fascinating from a range of different issues, and I'll, I won't go back to the bit issue because that's, um, it, that's a huge variation in itself. But I do go back to the responsibility and the rules that we create. Uh, those who compete should know the rules. Um, I say should because um, keeping, action, keeping pace with the rules and reading the whole of the rule book uh, doesn't always happen. <laughs> you can read bits of it which you think are relevant to yourself and, and ignore the rest. The rules are usually there originally for a pr pretty good reason. And part of that is distinctly the welfare of the horse and its perception as how that is seen uh, in and around that competition area. But knowing the, why the rules are there is perhaps more critical than knowing the rule itself, itself. And we sometimes make it so complicated that people no longer understand why those rules are there. And the vaccination policy has something to do with that. You're quite right. Those who are required to have a vaccination in order to compete may do so quite cheerfully, but they won't necessarily understand why they're vaccinating against that particular issue because they haven't really thought through what that would mean if it didn't happen. And we've just been reminded that even with flu, which we, seem as, we see as a treatable um, disease, can be fatal in, for large herds of unvaccinated animals. I remember being told that the first time I went to Hong Kong with the number of horses that died in China because there was no vaccination policy there. And you have to remind people about that from time to time. Part of this backs up, I think, what the World Horse Welfare has been doing over many years and how that, the strategy is evolving to strengthen those areas uh, which it needs to make more obvious, better connected, with, with more knowledge being spread and that wisdom that we need to have to understand why we're doing it. Using that strategy to blend that pragmatism, that understanding why people have horses, why they need horses in so many of the countries that we work in, that is still fundamentally true. That is a relationship which is a working relationship. But also the compassion uh, to improve the welfare uh, across the entire spectrum of the horse world. This is an organization that has been doing that for a very long time. And it's getting better and better, I think, at getting those, those really fundamental issues across to different uh, owners and the, the different partnerships and the different relationships that we need to have that understanding. The understanding of the value of horses to a local economy and the local in, and the individual within that economy drives what information we need to provide to them to ensure the best welfare for their animals and that that relationship works really well. That has worked. What I'm delighted to hear that the, the UK government has recognized this through the match funding for Haiti is that it also raises the profile of that understanding, not just in, in the UK government, but to other aid agencies who sometimes miss out that fundamental requirement to have a sustainable environment in which these people are living, and that horses and donkeys can be a really important part of that, and an ability for a community, a social structure, to get back on its feet economically can often depend upon their equids being healthy and being there in order to help them. So this is really good news, I think, from our ability to get that message across of the value of horses and donkeys in people's lives. But it's not just in disaster areas. It is in a local environment, just as true here in the UK. And the amount of people who work as we've seen, only slightly less than the agricultural sector in horses in the UK, makes them important socially to the rural area and environmentally, as we've been hearing 
very specifically about the new forest, but I think has a much broader um, influence that we need to be aware of. But it is still an important relationship here in the UK. It may have shifted from a purely work relationship into one which is seen as leisure, therefore have choices. But it is still um, a valued contributor to the social network within the UK. And you would expect me to say that as um, president of the Writing for the Disabled Association, I've seen some truly remarkable partnerships. And when you talk about welfare, the horses that work in the Writing for Disabled have some interesting challenges, which you wouldn't probably allow if you put an, um, a rider on under normal circumstances. But the way that that animal adapts, both to the physical challenges that they're faced with, but also the ability to understand their need to behave differently, because that is a different sort of human being, is quite extraordinary. And I think we shouldn't underestimate uh, the equine's ability to make choices. Uh, some of us know from painful experience that they're quite capable of saying no <laughs> um, when they don't want to do something. And sometimes they make it perfectly clear that that's not what they want to do. And for others, it's very obvious that they're very happy to do those things. And we shouldn't underestimate um, their ability to make choices. And we need to listen to what they're telling us in that respect. But they, they are also prepared to be our partners in a number of different ways. And we are extremely um, privileged that they do so. So therefore, it is our responsibility to make sure that that relationship and that partnership works as well as possible, that we have the information available to make a difference, to do it better uh, in the future. Going back to TAC, TAC has been around a very long time. Um, if you go to the London Museum, for instance, you will see some very, very, very old bits. Some things don't change very much. We need to be sure that we're changing them for the right reasons and that we're actually making things better in the long term and that we are responsible for those decisions that we make. It's always way too easy, isn't it, to blame someone else or combination of things. But I do think that area of responsibility is a, an area of debate that we should have as often as possible. Today has highlighted uh, some of the issues that we think of as purely welfare and others which we think are much more related to the law and the definition and of crime, which we think are simpler and more obvious. But they can all be tied together. And it's that broad sense of responsibility that challenges us all as to make sure that we get the, resp the responsibility in the right place, which really does make a difference. But I'm seriously grateful for all of those of you who contributed today, speakers, panels, and those who've asked questions. I hope you all feel that that has been, once again, an opportunity to learn, to be, be but importantly, be part of the event which can make a difference uh, to the lives of the horses and donkeys that we enjoy and that we truly do have to be responsible for. Thank you. Well, Clyde Ma'am, on behalf of everyone here, thank you for that very powerful, incisive, and broad speech. There are quite a few speeches being given around the country at the moment, and I, as you forgive me for saying, a few of them as well constructed or delivered as that. Um, I wouldn't be doing my job if, if I didn't express what I can feel in the room, uh, Your Royal Highness, a huge sense of respect and gratitude for your emphasis on care and compassion being at the heart of welfare, your insistence that human and animal welfare go together, and your very practical, and your insistence that all of this is rooted in the practical day-to-day -day business of, I was going to say horsemanship, but I, I'd rather say horse care. Thank you for all that you do for this great sector. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to hand over to Rowley to wrap us up. We are very late, so I will just focus on three words. Partnership, 
complexity and tolerance. We have heard time and time again, ever since our president talked about it two years ago, about the importance of partnership. The National Equine Welfare Council, the British Horse Council, and the International Coalition for Working Equids, to name but three. But I thought I'd just th think of it in a slightly different way. When you looked at the flu outbreaks, and there's been hundreds of flu outbreaks in the UK this year, when you looked at the, and the daily updates, and I would recommend you sign up to the Animal Health Trust daily updates, uh, which are brilliant, but most of them were in animals that are unvaccinated, that have been imported, sometimes from Ireland, but certainly from other parts of the country, into a multi-horse yard with, uh, a, in a population of animals that had variable vaccination status. So who's responsible there? Of course the owner is, but the transporter, the seller, the other people in those yards, I think we've got to think about the partnerships that we can do in our daily lives, not the grand stuff necessarily, as important that as is, it's the daily stuff that really will make a difference. Complexity. We've had some brilliant speakers today talking about how, you know, even things like bridal fit and hoarding and the challenges of getting people to understand horse racing better. It's, it's not easy, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't try and we cannot just put it into the too difficult pile. And as I said earlier, small steps really do make a difference. And so all urban riding schools, for example, aren't bad, because you can take small steps, understanding the three Fs that we've heard about today, and even if we're turning horses out in sand paddocks, giving them the room to be able to have some decent time to roll and interact with other animals. The Princess Royal has already said, we've got to learn to understand our horses. We're learning so much more about how we can read their behaviour, and that's the biggest transition over the last decade. Welfare isn't all about their physical uh, needs, it's also about their welfare needs. And then the last one around tolerance, because we seem to live in an increasingly, increasingly intolerant uh, uh, world at the moment, and Dave's going to buy me a beer, because he's the only one all day who talked about uh, the B words. Um, and, uh, but, you know, when we talk about that debate, it does become increasingly intolerant, and it's extraordinary that we've let ourselves get like that. So from when we're looking at equine sector challenges, we've got to be, remember, the good Lord gave you two ears and only one mouth. We should do... The, therefore listen twice as much as we speak. Therefore, that's enough from me. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Have a wonderful lunch. Well, thank you, Roly. You'll be glad to know uh, we're wrapping up, folks. This is it. Uh, thank you all for coming. Special thanks to all of our presenters, our panellists, speakers, and to those who are such intelligent questions. We've covered a huge amount of ground. It was a pretty ambitious topic, responsibility. I think you have done it justice. I think we've lifted quite a lot of rocks and explored some quite difficult issues. I wanted to re-emphasize all of our thanks for the generous sponsorship of the Sir Peter O'Sullivan Charitable Trust for making today possible, and the support of the Horse Race Betting Levy Board and MSD Animal Health. I can't help but close with a political quote. You started with Lincoln. I want to close with Roosevelt. At the heart of this today, I think, has been an insistence that you can have all the high strategic targets that you want, but in the end, you've got to embed this in the reality of day-to-day -day horse care. And as Roosevelt said, it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man or woman stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to those who are actually in the arena whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strive valiantly, who err, who come short again and again, who spend their time in a worthy cause, who at the best know in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if they fail, at least fail while daring greatly, so that their place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Now I want to invite you for lunch, remind you about your donation envelopes. Please don't just look at them. Don't take them home and wonder what they were for. Put a little something in them or something big in them. Please don't miss a Raju, just one of the sculptures on the World Horse Trail, currently up for auction online. Lovely Christmas present for somebody until the 20th of November with a live auction taking place on the 27th of this month. Please also visit the charity trade stands in the same room and do not miss the mini presentations from 155. You will Believe me, enjoy them. Thank you all for attending. Enjoy the rest of the day, and I leave you with this message. Please go out and spread the word that through World Horse Welfare, 
this great equine sector here in the UK is raising the bar domestically and internationally. Thank you.